します。Friends and colleagues, I'm Oscar Alves, neurosurgeon from Porto. I'm from the executive board of CSRS Europe, and along with Andres Kambali, my my colleague at the CSRS board, will be acting as the we webinar chairman. Indeed, we, we we create this cycle of webinars called the Road to Paris, uh, as we had trouble uh, with with COVID and uh, our congress was postponed to to May 2021. Our first webinar. Was on 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 cranial vertebral junction surgery with Professor Bernard George and Professor Goel. Uh, it was very well received. Uh, reason why we are, we are returning with a, with a new one. We choose topics for discussion that may impact in in everyday questions of our our spine practice. And uh, certainly there is a, an increasing number of fusion surgeries being performed, and this can raise many many management dilemmas. Uh, sometimes fusions aren't not at all necessary, uh, but sometimes you have to overdo, you have to extend to 360 fusion. So we'll revise the indications for, for 360 fusion, how to perform it, including the staging sequences. Uh, so for, for this, I, I managed to, to invite outstanding professors here, uh, and the professor uh, Ryu, Daniel Ryu, from, from New York, uh, we have Tony Martin from, uh, from uh, Spain, uh, Dr. Jerónimo Milano from Brazil, Dr. Tatsui from, uh, from, um, uh, from, Paul, from, from Brazil, but he also works in America, actually. So we're not, without any further delay, uh, I, I will introduce our guest speaker, Dan Rio. Is professor of orthopedic surgery at Columbia University, director of surgical spine surgery. Uh, he was a former uh, president of uh, CSRS North America, our sister society. And it's someone that has really huge experience. His uh, practice is limited to cervical spine. It remembers us, our dearest friend, uh, uh, Jose Casamichana, that, uh, that was one of the members of our board. Uh, also dedicated. So I'm, I guess Daniel is, is the perfect person to tell us about uh, the indications and how to do uh, circumferential operations in cervical spine. So please go ahead, Daniel. Right, thank you very much, uh, Oscar, and uh, it's my privilege and honor to be here with you today. And uh, so uh, first, uh, my disclosures, I do get some royalties on some products um, and uh, own stocks in some companies and uh, do some consulting now and then for various uh, companies and teach courses for them. So we often do anterior surgery and everybody likes doing anterior cervical operations because they are uh, easy to do and patients do very well. Um, and anterior operations are perfect for patients who have a low pseudarthrosis risk or non-osteoporotic and um, uh, who um, uh, you want to avoid uh, operations on because uh, they're too sick to have a, a, a prolonged anterior posterior operation, or they have uh, something in the posterior neck that would make uh, them at significant risk for developing uh, wound complications. Now, I've done multi-level anterior operations for all kinds of Hi, can you hear me? Okay, yes, good, sorry. Yeah, no, go, go ahead, sorry. Okay, because uh, I was muted. I just realized uh, that I was uh, muted yeah, up that, now. That's, yeah, fine, thank you. Okay, so these are, yeah, yeah. Uh, these are my disclosures again. I get uh, some uh, royalties and some products and own some stocks. Anterior operations are great for a lot of indications. Uh, if you have a low pseudarthrosis risk and are not osteoporotic, um, and uh, if you're at risk for developing problems after a prolonged operation, or you're at risk for developing wound complications, then uh, doing an anterior alone may be the right uh, type of operation. And I've done anterior alone on uh, multi-level uh, problems uh, like this. And as long as you immobilize the patient for a very long time or use uh, bone healing substances, I think you can get away with a lot of anterior type of procedures where you can get 
uh, multi-level fixation, and we've reported on hybrid technologies such as corpectomy, corpectomy, or skip corpectomy, or corpectomy, discectomy, where you do one level corpectomy and another level discectomy. And this is a case of a multi-level um, uh, uh, disease with severe stenosis that I think most people would tackle this posteriorly, um, but, um, uh, or anterior posterior. We did this anteriorly and we immobilized the patient and uh, uh, the patient actually ended up healing all of these levels after a long period of time and did well. Now, if you talk about circumferential operations, there are many indications for doing circumferential operations. Uh, obviously, anyone who's at uh, increased risk for pseudoarthrosis. If you're osteoporotic, if you have a bad deformity, uh, just doing one anterior or posterior increases the risk of uh, loss of correction postoperatively. If you have a risk of graft extrusion or tumors or infections or unstable trauma, sometimes you do a short anterior posterior in order to uh, save fusion levels. So instead of doing, let's say, multi levels, uh, or using pedicle screws, you may do a front back in order to uh, get good fixation, uh, but not operate at many levels. Uh, if you have a patient with cerebral palsy who has athetoid uh, movements of the neck or Parkinson's or any type of movement disorder where they're at risk for um, pulling out their instrumentation, that's another indication for doing an anterior posterior. A multiply operated patient, uh, if somebody's had four or five operations before, the last thing they want is uh, an operation done from the front that goes on to a non-union, and then you have to do a, another operation. And finally, if somebody, um, uh, uh, you want uh, them to have an early fusion, maybe they're a pain management patient or somebody who uh, you say, I absolutely have to make sure that this person fuses and fuses early, uh, maybe they're a construction worker and they can't take that much time off of work and they can't wear a collar and they need a three-level fusion. If you do it from the front and back, then you can get them back to work much faster. This is a, um, I'm going to show a series of cases of uh, patients who we did front-back operations on. This is a 54-year-old. He had radiation and uh, radiation will uh, often lead to fatty degeneration and vacuolization in the posterior neck and the muscles will turn into fatty vacuoles. And so that person is at risk for pseudarthrosis. Um, and, uh, so, uh, and, and this patient also developed the dropped head syndrome. So the indications here are bad deformity, multiple levels of, uh, of stenosis, and um, a patient who has some osteoporosis and uh, high likelihood of developing pseudarthrosis. This is a patient who is osteoporotic and uh, had a dropped head syndrome. And uh, the original surgeon did a posterior operation and she developed a compression fracture and uh, he sent the patient to me for uh, uh, fixation. And obviously we went all the way down, but the anterior column is missing on this. So even if you bring her back up, there's a risk for collapse. And so we did an anterior corpectomy and reconstruction as well as a posterior operation. This is an opioid dependent um, and a recent, uh, she did quit smoking for this operation, but she was a recent smoker and she's opioid dependent. And if I just did a posture alone in this patient, it would have been very painful. It would have taken her a long time to heal. But by doing an anterior and a posterior operation, we can correct her um, uh, post uh, laminectomy kyphosis. We can uh, uh, realign her spine and we can get her to heal fast so that we can get her off of uh, the uh, narcotics as quickly as possible because she doesn't want to uh, be addicted to narcotics again. And as uh, being a recent smoker, doing this many levels, she's at significant risk for developing a non-union. This is a patient who had uh, PJK uh, after a, a thoracic operation and she too is osteoporotic and she's had an anterior operation in the past. And again, uh, for somebody who's multiply operated and uh, that you have to do levels, it's much better to uh, do them front and back and get them healed. This is a patient who has a, both a deformity and a uh, post-traumatic uh, severe kyphosis with, and uh, it was fixed in that position. And we did an osteotomy followed by uh, anterior posterior fusion. This is a patient who's had three prior operations and uh, uh, you can see that the facet has been uh, totally removed and yet they still have a mild deformity and compression behind those areas. And uh, so once again, the last thing she wants is a 
fourth operation, and subsequently, if she develops a pseudoarthrosis, a fifth operation. And so it's much better to do it circumferentially front and back so that uh, she's positive that this is the last time she'll need surgery at these levels. Now, obviously, it doesn't prevent you from developing adjacent level problems, but at least at these levels, doing a front and back, I liken it to saying that you never have to say you're sorry because it always heals and it always does pretty well. Now, how about unstable revisions? If you have somebody with a graft extrusion, I think it's time to do a front back operation, especially if you did the first operation. If you do operation number two, I always say, make sure that you don't have to do operation number three. Or if you've had a patient with a post-laminectomy kyphosis, that's a special situation where you have a very unstable spine if you go in anteriorly and do a corpectomy. So this is a patient who um, uh, was sent to me. The original surgeon did an uninstrumented, I think it was a, yeah, a three-level ACDF. And uh, postoperatively, that patient developed both a retropharyngeal hematoma as well as a retrovertebral uh, epidural uh, hematoma. And so he took all of this out and he did a, um, uh, a two-level corpectomy on this patient and instrumented, but she extruded. It's an elderly patient, osteoporotic. A, uh, a two-level corpectomy like this is uh, at significant risk for um, uh, extrusion. And so he sent the patient to me. I redid her front and back. And, uh, and this is what probably should have been done uh, with the second operation instead of uh, uh, hoping that uh, uh, she would stay in with the uh, second operation. If you have anyone with a long corpectomy, so if I have somebody with a two-level corpectomy, uh, a total corpectomy at two levels, I will almost always do a front and a back operation. A single-level corpectomy, I think you can get away with. Two levels, you can get away with most of the time, but maybe up to about 5% of the time, you'll have graft-related problems. And uh, I think 5% complication rate is way too high, especially if your uh, rate of posterior complications is significantly lower than um, uh, 5%. So two or more levels of corpectomies, in my opinion, um, is it's, you're better off doing a front and a back operation. You can see uh, this case that uh, Sandy Emery uh, sent to me years ago. It wasn't his case, it was somebody else's case. Uh, they did a, a, a two-level corpectomy and, uh, and uh, plated it, but obviously the plate didn't hold. This case on the left was my case where I did a two-level corpectomy anterior alone, and you can see there was a subsidence and the screw partially pulled out. Uh, they healed in this position, so uh, I was fortunate, but as they say, you're better lucky than good, and I was lucky in that the patient healed in this position and didn't extrude the way uh, uh, this case did. So if I have somebody with a two-level corpectomy, I think you're far better off um, uh, with uh, posterior uh, stabilization. Uh, that way, you never have to worry about this graft uh, kicking out. And if you have somebody with a uh, bad infection, I think that uh, this is the wrong thing to do. Um, uh, this is a very grossly unstable situation. You have more metal here than bone. Uh, I'm not sure that this patient ever healed. Uh, and if you have somebody with an infection, the bone is often compromised and it's soft. And by the time you debride all of this bone, um, uh, the end plates are too weak. You do this anteriorly, there's still motion and they can't fight the infection. But if you do it anteriorly and posteriorly, they have rigid immediate stability. And that rigid immediate stability allows things to heal and for the infection to subside. Uh, we reported uh, years ago with my partner, Larry Lenke, on using titanium cages. Uh, as long as you do a front-back operation, you can put in allograft, you can put in fibula allograft, titanium cages, just about anything, and the body will be able to clear the infection. But if you just do it uh, on the anterior side or posterior side and there's still motion at those segments, the infection often will recur. So when you have an infection, you got to make sure that you get a very stable spine. If you have somebody who has an osteoligamentous injury, for instance, uh, you can see this patient has a uh, C6 um, uh, uh, fracture. You have to wonder, is your patient going to be um, compliant? Because you've never met this patient before. You see them for the first time um, when they come into the hospital with this uh, terrible fracture. You can see on the MRI, there's clear uh, ligamentous injury posteriorly. 
and this patient has a three column injury and it's a teardrop fracture. Um, and it's the worst stage of teardrop where you have retrolisthesis and ligamentous injury. And this is not somebody that I would trust with just an anterior corpectomy alone. Uh, by doing a front back, you can be sure that uh, whether this patient is going to be compliant or not, it's gonna be almost impossible for them to pull things out. And you're gonna be sure that even if they don't wear the collar the way you tell them to, that it'll be stable. Another chronic fracture, this is a patient uh, who has a C5 chronic fracture. It's a late trauma with a neurologic deficit. Again, they're likely to do much better. You've got uh, area of cord compression and uh, cord signal change that extend uh, behind these two vertebral bodies. You're much better off doing a front back than doing a two-level corpectomy in this patient and hoping that the patient will wear that collar. If you have a patient with post-laminectomy kyphosis, we wrote this paper years ago about if you do a corpectomy in somebody who's had a previous laminectomy, how dangerous that is because you have two halves of the spine, the left and the right, that are disconnected. Uh, I did this when I was a fellow, uh, and I did a three-level corpectomy on this patient, and even in a halo, he extruded. Uh, that was uh, when I was with Henry Bowman, and he would never instrument these patients, and uh, so I ended up having to fix him with a four-level corpectomy. So the reason you get that instability with a laminectomy is once you have the laminectomy and then you do a corpectomy, now you have the left and right halves of the spine that are completely disconnected. And so it's very unstable to uh, torsional uh, forces. And that's why the graft kicks out. So when you have a patient with a post-laminectomy kyphosis, the safest alternative is to go long and go strong, which means going front and back and taking care of all the levels so that they never have an extrusion. And if you have somebody with a deformity and instability at the cervical thoracic junction or with a deficient anterior column, I think that's another indication for doing surgery. So this is a patient with a flexible deformity, uh, uh, similar to a dropped head syndrome with multiple levels. You can see spondylosis all throughout. And what we can do is do an anterior operation to correct most of the deformity and then you have to get good correction posteriorly. So the key to doing that is positioning. And you want to correct that lordosis before you put down the rods uh, because the rods um, uh, basically get you a little bit of correction. It's the positioning that gets you the ma majority of your correction. So you can see the pre-op and post-op. And you can even see that her lower back, um, the lumbar uh, hyperlordosis corrects itself because she no longer has to hyperlordose down here in order to look straight ahead. This is a patient with adjacent level junctional kyphosis. Uh, there's a case that uh, my partner, uh, Larry uh, Lanky and Keith Bridwell had done uh, something like, uh, I think uh, 30 uh, years ago, and she developed uh, problems at the adjacent level. And, uh, and so, uh, and she's elderly and she's uh, got osteoporosis. So if you really wanna fix this all from the posterior aspect, you either need to put in cervical pedicle screws or go up to the second cervical vertebra or get multiple areas of fixation. We just did an anterior posterior and fused, uh, we did a T1 corpectomy, put in uh, anterior column support to get a lot of correction and did uh, it posteriorly. And she's never needed um, uh, further surgery on her cervical spine. So we preserved her cervical range of motion and sometimes doing that anterior posterior operation will allow you to save fusion levels so that you don't have to go very long. When you have somebody with metastatic breast cancer or any other kind of cancer that you might have to do radiation on, I think that's another indication to do anterior posterior because often these patients won't heal. And sometimes after you do this one level corpectomy, you seed the next vertebral level with tumor and that level starts falling apart. And if it falls apart in you have an only an anterior, this can extrude. But by doing it posteriorly and anteriorly, you're much more likely to get a solid early healing and allow the patient to go back to living life normally. People with uh, cancer, they don't want one neck operation now, another neck operation next year, and another neck operation a year and a half later. Because for them, if they have, let's say, a five-year um, lifespan left, and you take out six months of that time in order to, for them to heal from their cervical spine operation, that's one-tenth of their remaining um, uh, life span. If you do this, they're healed in about three months, and it's only a three-month period that they have to be recuperating from a, an operation. 
and odds are they'll never need surgery again. Now, you want to avoid complications when you're doing anterior posterior operation. The complications you can get are root deficits, airway compromise, and you have to understand which levels go on to arthrosis. So let's talk about complication avoidance. Uh, if you do a posterior operation alone, you have to be aware of post-op root deficits. There are papers uh, in the literature that talk about a C5 palsy, a C8 palsy, and even a T1 palsy after correcting their lordosis, a, a kyphosis with a, uh, a lordosing uh, operation. So this is a patient with a dropped head syndrome that we did a posterior alone operation on. And when you do this in a patient who has foraminal stenosis and you don't do extensive foraminotomies, you can end up with a root deficit. So in order to try to avoid that, what I do when I place a patient, when I see a patient for the first time, I know that I'm going to be doing a, um, a deformity correction, or I have to take them from a neutral position to a, an extension position, and they have a tight foramen on uh, their radiographic uh, studies but are not symptomatic right now, I will have them lie down on a table with their neck in hyperextension, and I leave them there for about 10 or 15 minutes while I look at the x-rays. If they start complaining about a lot of pain going down their arm or numbness or tingling or weakness in the arm, you have to do a foraminotomy because if you don't, that person, if you put them in that position in their cervical spine, they're going to have a postoperative root deficit, especially because you are going to do maximal extension during their operation. This is a, what I call a bivector traction, where's, where one rope goes over and another goes through and I can have anesthesia change from one rope to the other, so I can go from a flexion rope to an extension rope without having to unscrub and undo a Mayfield headrest, et cetera. And when I do posterior operations, I often use spinous process cables in order to uh, lower dose that spine, but you gotta be aware that if you do that, you can cause an iatrogenic foraminal stenosis with a neurologic deficit. That's because in flexion, you have uh, relatively large foramina, but as you extend that spine, what ends up happening is that you end up narrowing down that foramen and you can cause a root compression during extension. And so that's why you have to do a foraminotomy before you do an extension. But there are times when a foraminotomy is done and they still have a root deficit. And that's because a foraminotomy doesn't necessarily help. If you have a patient who has a collapsed disc space, you can do a foraminotomy, but when you hyperlordose that spine, you're still decreasing the interpedicular distance. That cranial caudal distance still gets narrowed down because the anterior column is already narrow to begin with. You've lost the disc height, now you're decreasing the foraminal height with your posterior compression. On the other hand, if you do the anterior first, what you're doing is you're restoring that interpedicular uh, foraminal height, and so, after doing that, even if you lordose the spine, you're not gonna pinch that nerve cranially, caudally, the way you would with a posterior only operation. So this is somebody who had kyphosis. We did an anterior first. We uh, enlarged the disc height at all of these levels, and then we corrected their kyphosis posteriorly, but because we enlarged their um, foraminal height, Patients uh, uh, using this type of a technique will not develop a root compression. It's another case of a patient that we did anterior uh, uh, first because they had severe uh, collapse of uh, the disc spaces, and then we did them posteriorly in order to correct their uh, malalignment. Now, how about airway compromise? Uh, in order to avoid airway compromise, because if you're doing an anterior posterior operation the same day, which is how I do all of these, I'd say 98% of these procedures I do the same day, you want to keep that patient in reverse from Dellenberg because if they're flat or their head is down, their face and their retropharyngeal space is going to continue to swell. If you did the anterior first, you're going to bleed out of that with uh, the increased hydrostatic pressure when you have uh, somebody in a Trendelenburg position. So keep them in as reverse a Trendelenburg a position as possible so that the fluid tends to flow downhill. I uh, use retropharyngeal steroids on the vast majority of these patients that when I do a front and a back operation. And I started using it in 2005 and I used it uh, whenever I would use BMP because that would reduce the swelling from the BMP. And I also used it in, in front back cases. But then we reported on this um, complication of retropharyngeal um, steroid 
uh, uh, Sang Lee and, uh, and I had uh, uh, patients that had complications that he had reported that this uh, works very nicely, but we had two cases of a delayed esophageal perforation uh, from using retropharyngeal steroids. This was his case and uh, you can see he did an ACDF, it went well, but two months post-op he presented with a strep viridans infection and uh, needed uh, repair of the esophageal perforation and uh, uh, did fine uh, ultimately. And I had a patient similar to this that also uh, one year after the surgery developed uh, uh, an esophageal perforation after an ankylosing spondylitis uh, fix. I always use a Penrose drain and I put an uh, ABD pad around it. And uh, uh, these types of drains um, often will clot. If there's too much bleeding, it will clot. And uh, if there isn't enough bleeding, you don't need the drain. And uh, whereas with a Penrose drain, uh, it can't stay in the wound. It'll always come out and it can't clot. And so this is a person who uh, had uh, a soaked drain um, within a couple of hours. And then you just change the dressing and you just let them drain, let them drain. And then when it stops draining, you pull out the Penrose drain. That's a much safer uh, type of drain. And if you have somebody who's uh, face down, you can continue to get that bleeding so that uh, this will uh, help them uh, prevent uh, uh, serious complications. So the first question I have is if a patient who had anterior posterior surgery was left intubated overnight for airway protection, the following day a cuff leak test is performed. And you should all know how to do a cuff leak test, and I think most people do, but in case you don't, I put in this question. So is it A, endotracheal cuff balloon is deflated completely and the patient is asked to breathe, B, the endotracheal cuff is, um, and you see the questions there. Uh, so if, uh, let's uh, take a poll to see what people think. Do you uh, do the endotracheal cuff uh, inflation maximally to see if there is a leak? Do you do an endotracheal cuff is deflated and the lumen of the tube is occluded? and uh, the endotracheal cuff is deflated while the patient is on a ventilator. How does one do an, uh, a cuff leak test? So um, we'll give it a few nope. more seconds. Okay, we, we, we might have a technical problem here. So uh, then, then just go ahead with the answer, please. Okay, all right. So oh, let me put this away. So the answer is the endotracheal cuff is deflated and the lumen of the tube is occluded. So how does that work? This is, uh, whoops, this isn't supposed to move there. So what you do is um, uh, you um, uh, put your finger on the tube and you deflate the cuff because if you have a lot of edema, then you can't breathe around this tube. You can't breathe through the tube because you got your finger on it. If there's edema, the patient will struggle to breathe and there's no air coming out because uh, all of the uh, soft tissues in the trachea have compressed around that uh, endotracheal uh, cuff. But if you let the balloon down and there's no edema, then what will happen is you can breathe right around the tube and the patient will be able to breathe. And you want to make sure that they have that uh, as a positive, that they can breathe before you extubate them. Because if you don't do that, as soon as the tube comes out, the airway closes and, and you can't get the tube back in, the patient can die as a result of that. Next question. Um, Let's see. Okay. Okay. So the next question um, is, um, uh, if you have somebody that uh, you've done a uh, reconstruction on, what is both necessary and sufficient? Not just necessary, but what is both necessary and sufficient before the anesthesiologist can extubate the patient and send them to the recovery room? In other words, you're done with the case, and uh, an anesthesia is saying uh, that, uh, okay, I think we're ready to extubate the patient. And you say, okay, here are the things that you got to make sure. Does the patient have no facial edema? Is the cuff leak test uh, okay? Medically, hemodynamically, and neurologically, are they stable? Now, if you have all of those things, uh, are you able to pull the tube out? And if that is the case, uh, then you say D. And uh, E is uh, no, 
I don't care what those say, you still can't extubate the patient. And the answer for this, let's see if... Um, well, just we, we need to fix this then. Oh, okay. Okay, don't worry, please, sorry. Right. Okay, so well, the, then, answer, um, the answer for this is that none of the above are both necessary and sufficient. If you have done a long anterior and a posterior operation, let me just uh, move this. If you've done a long um, operation uh, that has lasted 12 hours for an anterior posterior for a tumor resection, and you've done all of this, it doesn't matter if any of those are positive. The patient can develop edema overnight and uh, lose their airway. You wanna keep that patient intubated and in an ICU. If you're taking that long for a procedure like this, uh, you wanna keep them intubated. I typically have these parameters. If the retraction time anteriorly is less than three hours, and if the posterior operation takes less than six hours on top of that, then I feel comfortable extubating if you meet all of these criteria. If you have a 12 hour anterior posterior operation, that's too long. And uh, so at the most I will do is about nine hours and it has to be less than three hours of anterior retraction time. So if your anterior operation, for instance, takes five hours, that alone means you should keep them intubated. So nothing beyond three hours, even with an anterior alone, uh, I, think, uh, uh, I think you have to be very careful about uh, extubating somebody if you've been retracting their neck for more than three hours, because retraction for three hours means that the total operation is probably taking three and a half to four hours. So um, you have to be very, very careful. Question number three, if all of the things are equal, which of the following has a greater risk for post-op airway compromise, a three hours of retraction for a one-level ACDF or three hours retraction for a five-level ACDF? And the answer is, actually, if you have three hours, if it takes you three hours to do a one-level ACDF, let's see, yeah, I think it's uh, the question's uh, still not. Uh, no, not working, I'm sorry. Okay. That's all right. Uh, so if you have somebody, if, you, if it takes you three hours to do a one level ACDF, you probably should keep that patient intubated because you're putting the retractor and retracting in one spot for three hours. So you're gonna get a lot of edema there. If it takes you three hours to do a five level, then you're only spending maybe 20 minutes per level. And uh, so uh, there's not much uh, airway edema. And you've also done a much more extensive dissection. So at any given level, there's a lot less pressure on the trachea and the esophagus. And uh, so, uh, and you'll see this, if you spend three hours doing a single level ACDF, the patient will wake up and complain of a severe sore throat. If you take five, uh, three hours to do five levels, a patient will wake up and say, I can swallow fine. I don't have any difficulty swallowing because you haven't pulled on their throat very much during that entire operation. And then the final question, which level in a four level ACDF from C3 to seven is most likely to uh, go on to a pseudoarthrosis? Is it the top level, the next level, the next level, or the bottom level? And the answer is D, C67. No matter what levels you do, we did a study recently, it's gonna be coming out, that it's the bottom level because biomechanically, that's the level that sees the most force. So I often do four level ACDFs from the front alone without backing it up in the back. And what I tell them is I can either do a front back and you'll be fused solidly, or I can do just, I can do the front alone and you're likely to develop a pseudo. And if you do, then we just usually only have to do a one level in the back, which is much less extensive surgery doing, than doing a four level in the back. So if you'd rather only have one operation be guaranteed that you're healed, we'll do it front back the first time. But if you'd rather have a less invasive operation that hurts a lot less, we'll do the answer alone. And there may be about a 10% chance that you might need a second operation, but usually it's just a one level posterior, which hurts a lot less and is more minimally invasive. And a lot of patients just say, I'd rather just have the anterior alone and I'll take my chances and I'll wear my collar. So that's mm -hmm. how I uh, handle um, a lot of these anterior posterior operations to avoid the front back operations. Um, so in conclusion, the key is get them corrected uh, by positioning them properly. And uh, you get most of these corrections anteriorly and you gotta do foraminal uh, decompressions. 
Um, I often will plate the lowest level because if you don't plate that lowest level, that's the level that uh, ends up, uh, uh, even with posterior instrumentation, sometimes collapsing. And you want to do meticulous dissection and meticulous closure when you're doing the posterior uh, operations because otherwise your infection rate will be much higher. And there are a lot of indications for doing anterior posterior operations. And uh, uh, we talked about uh, patients with osteoporosis, multiple levels, uh, pseudoarthrosis risk, patients with tumors and trauma, uh, multiply operated patients, multi-level operations, um, and uh, patients that you want to save uh, fusion levels on. But if you add them all up together, you have to understand that there are serious complications when you do that front-back operation. And uh, so you have to keep an eye on their airway uh, to make sure that their airway isn't compromised. Uh, you have to uh, keep them in reverse Trendelenburg when you're doing the posture operation. Uh, you have to know how to do a cricothyrotomy in case uh, that might uh, uh, become necessary postoperatively. And uh, the one benefit of doing that anterior posterior is that uh, as long as your wound complications and root deficit complications are low, that uh, ultimately, uh, I like to say, as I said before, that a front back means never having to say you're sorry that uh, things didn't heal. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Dan, thank you. Thank you so much. This was really a wonderful, wonderful lecture. Thank you so much. It, mir it reflects really a lot of experience and uh, all these uh, small tips and tricks that you that you told us it's really uh, outstanding i think it was so clear that we can conclude the webinar here <laughs> well <laughs> so now it's open to questions and um, actually i would like uh, andres Comalia to come is is the co-host andres are you are you are you around microphone andres, yes, yes. Hi. Yes, oh no, I my congratulations to Dan Rief because it was it has been an excellent excellent talk with a lot of topics and probably the, the, the delegates has a lot of questions. I have seen on the on the screen, for instance, what uh, what is could be first the anterior or the back uh, uh, operation. But I think that the question it could change it depending on the each case probably. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if now Oscar is open to question for the yes yes it's panelists. open I mean the the the, the panelists they can uh, yeah. raise questions so so my, my question for you for you Danny it's in, in terms of a let's say a degenerative spondylotic patient with myelopathy you know the the main interest of the operation is also to enlarge the canal and this can be done uh, perfectly from the posterior side. Uh, that's the way you can enlarge most the canal. Uh, so why not just to do it from the back where you, you can have the best of both worlds. You can decompress the canal better than through corpectomy. And you have a construct that is really rigid. If there are many, many biomechanical studies comparing uh, 360 with posterior alone. And you probably have the same, the same resistance, the same rigidity of the construct. Can you comment on this? Please? Yeah, so the, the one benefit of uh, doing a front back as opposed to a laminectomy infusion alone is that uh, when you do the laminectomy and you put in instrumentation, the only place that you can get a fusion is in the facet joints. And so there isn't as much room there. And so if you have somebody who's at risk for pseudoarthrosis, um, even if you decorticate the facets and pack in bone, it may take them over six months to a year for them to heal all of those levels. And during that time, they come in complaining about neck pain and interscapular pain and all of that. And, uh, and they're on narcotics for you know, months at a time. Whereas if you do it front back, in three months, they're healed. And uh, so, uh, so in those patients, it's worthwhile. Uh, if you don't want to use cervical pedicle screws, and let's say you're doing from 3C3 to C7, um, uh, and you use lateral mass screws, well, there is, that's not a very strong construct and they can pull out if you have osteoporosis. But if you're going from, let's say, C2 to T2, uh, you can get very good fixation into C2 pedicles and T1, T2 pedicles. I think it's perfectly reasonable and they're not a pain patient. Even if they don't heal at all the levels, often the pain will settle down in uh, patients uh, 
And uh, so it's a perfectly reasonable thing just to do a posterior. But as I said, if you just do a posterior and extension, you can get foraminal compression. So sometimes you have to do a central decompression and foraminotomy. You're taking 50% of this facet, 50% of this facet, and you're taking all the posterior elements. Now, where are you going to put the bone graft and where is it going to heal? And uh, so th those are some of the situations that I think about. Good. Any, any other questions from uh, Geronimo or Tony? Yes. You, uh, please, go ahead. May I? Join him. Okay, thank you. So, Dan, congratulations. Uh, great lecture, as always. <laughs> so, uh, my point is about uh, when you are doing a, a two or three level waste CDF, um, you, you talk a little about to, to plate the lower level. Uh, what do you do? Uh, I mean, um, standalone cages in, for example, C4, C5, and C6, uh, C5, C6, and then C7, C6, C7, a plate, or do a big plate? What, what, where, what do you prefer? So when I have a three level ACDF that I'm doing, uh, or more, say three or four level ACDF, I'd like to put standalones at the top and not use anything more than a three level plate. Um, I think it's much easier to use a, a two or three level plate. So if I have a three level operation, I do a standalone here and then do a plate down here because this level has a hard time healing, so I always plate this level. And uh, the top level is the easiest to heal, so I think a standalone, which I don't think heals as well as allograft and a plate. So I put the standalone here to make it much easier. The other thing is, let's say I'm doing 5, 6, 6, 7, C7, T1. If I uh, put a standalone here and I put the plate here, later on, if I have to do this level, I can put a plate right across this level um, without having to remove all of this uh, um, uh, uh, prior to putting on that new plate level. So that's another advantage of doing a standalone at the very top level. What about the incision? Uh, you published some years ago about doing two transverse incision instead of uh, a, a longer incision uh, uh, longitudinal. Is, is this what you is still doing, two uh, transverse incision? Yeah, so you can do uh, three to four levels through one transverse incision, but if you're doing five and six and seven levels, I typically will make one transverse here and one down here. Uh, it's much more cosmetically pleasing than a long uh, carotid incision, which patients hate. I mean, they all say, oh, I don't care what the incision looks like, but they all care. And, uh, and so I would care and you would care. So in, you can have an incision that is very cosmetically pleasing, that's sort of under the chin so you can't see it, and one at the base so that your shirt covers it, and the patient looks like they've never had surgery. And these heal so nicely anyway. Uh, so if I have that, uh, uh, anything more than a uh, four level, I will uh, use two transverse incisions. Totally agree, Thank you. Thank you. thanks a lot. Then uh, I have a question here from Dr. Um, Krishna Sharma, our friend, professor from, uh, from Nepal. He's asking uh, if you do discectomy in the levels where you are putting plate. So um, I, I always plate the bottom level um, because of the risk of pseudoarthrosis. And um, uh, any level that has a deformity, I will uh, plate. So if let's say that you've got kyphosis at the C4-5 level, and you have um, uh, problems that you're doing four, five, five, six, six, seven. I think if you just put a standalone cage of C4, five, it'll collapse. So I will put a big structural graft to fill front to back and side to side, and I will plate that in lordosis uh, so that uh, it doesn't collapse. Okay, uh, another question, uh, Daniel. Uh, so for uh, just say a regular case, not deformity, uh, you do uh, two, three levels me. So when you do from the back, you always do one level above, one, one level below your front construct? Uh, no, no. I usually try to do the front and back at the same levels. And that way, you, you're always uh, healed. So let's say that um, uh, I decide that uh, for a patient with bad deformity, I have to go from C2 to T2. I will always try to do C2 to T2 in the front and the back. Um, because then every level heals and there's much less pain if you do a front and a back because it feels like you're fused already. So those patients, they only have to get over the muscle um, uh, trauma of the surgery for their pain to subside. Whereas if you do, let's say, only two levels in the front and seven levels in the back, all those levels that you're decorticating the facet joints, they hurt because you'll see when you do a posterior operation, you turn them anterior for an anterior operation, even with the posterior instrumentation in, 
you can move that spine. It's still very mobile. And uh, so every little movement, if you've got a decorticated facet joint, they'll complain about severe pain. And it hurts a lot more to do a posterior look than an anterior posterior because it feels like you're fused immediately. Excellent. Any, any other questions from the panel? Tony? No, I think that uh, uh, the, the important thing is to, to obtain a good free section in the, by posterior, it really depends on the, the quality of the ball. And I think uh, in our experience, you know, people we need to go to, to the upper part of the C2 because we need to, if we finish on C3 habitually and the size of the, pedic the, of the pedicles of the cervical spine is not enough. Mm -hmm. We will put the, the lateral mass uh, screw, it's not enough. I, we prefer go to the, the C2 habitually in these long constructions yeah. to avoid the, the failure. I agree. Okay. I could see you. Yeah. Okay, so now we're going to proceed. Uh, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Rui. I have a question, sir. Okay, okay. Sorry, go ahead. So, Ali. Yeah, th this is Dr. Altaf Ali. I'm from Karachi. So my question is regarding an ankylizing spondylitis. If you have a fracture, for example, uh, in an ankylizing spondylitis uh, at the level of C4 and obvious deformity as well, then what will you do? So that's a patient that uh, you have to go very long. And usually those ankylosing spondylitis patients are auto-fused all the way up to C2 and often up to the skull. If they're fused up to the skull, I go from the skull down into the thoracic spine. So in those patients, even three points above and three points below are often not enough because they, with the fusion, they develop osteoporosis. And uh, because of the osteoporosis, you have to get very good fixation. The minimum fixation is into C2s, C2, 3, and 4, and then 5, 6, 7, T1. That's the minimum. If they're fused to the skull, then I would say then uh, you can go right up to the skull. If they're not fused to the skull and you don't get good fixation at C2, 3, and 4, I would flip them over and do a plate also at the, the 4 or 5 level where they have the fracture. Okay, excellent. So yes. I think for the sake of time, we need to, to go, to move on, to allow Excuse everybody to, to, to present. And uh, I call Dr. Reynas now. Dr. Reynas is a uh, young, uh, our senior resident. Um, he was awarded last year the traveling fellowship from TFRS Europe. So he's someone, a uh, young, young uh, person, but uh, with, uh, with already an interest in, in uh, cervical spine. So I invite Rui to, to show his case. Hey, thank you very much. Um, before I, I begin, I'd like to thank CSRS and Dr. Oscar Alves for the opportunity to present the, the case which I'm bringing before you today. So Dr. Oscar, if you could share the, the screen for me. Very well. So the case I'm... Um, bringing here today is about the uh, complication in a, in a patient with a cervical spondylodesitis. So we're talking about a 55 year old female who presented with severe neck and arm pain, BAS8 ongoing for a week, grade three flaccid threatoparesis over the, the previous 36 hours with fever with systemic inflammatory syndrome, leukocytosis, high C-reactive protein, uh, erythrocyte sentimentation rate of 106, acute kidney dysfunction, and uh, with isolation of uh, methicillin sensitive staph aureus in two different hemocultures. So the, the MRI, the cervical MRI, presented with a lesion centered around C4 and C5 with, uh, involving both vertebral bodies, uh, significant cord compression, retropharyngeal spread, and in the axial cuts, we could see that it presented with the, with the gadolinium enhancement. So, it, we're talking probably about an infectious, uh, an infectious case. What would you do next? What would be your next step? Would you take a CT-guided function, external immobilization, and a long course of, uh, of IV antibiotics? Would you do a, a strictly anterior approach, debride, reconstruct the fuse, 360 approach and same as a plus a posterior fixation or would you just 
reduce the deformity and uh, stabilize posteriorly and red, let the antibiotic do the rest. So the poll now is, is open to vote. You can see it in, on your screen. So, so it's question one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it and seems that uh, tight race between B and C. So it seems that that uh, half of the people would say B anterior approach for the Breitman reconstruction and fusion. Forty percent would go immediately for a three hundred sixty and 20% would try external reduction of the deformity and proceed a stabi uh, stabilization. So, which, would make, which would make some sense because traditionally we would consider tackling the problem where it is. So what have problem. you done, Rui? So we went uh, at first for the anterior approach only. Uh, we noticed while we were positioning under the x-ray that the deformity was reducible. So what we did was a C4 and C5 uh, carpectomy. Uh, we place an expandable cylinder without bone graft and an anterior plate. Then we treated the patient for six weeks with a double antibiotic regimen. And uh, at eight weeks, we could see that the patient was evolving positively. Um, we, can, we could see a good decompression. We could see that the concert was holding. The flare signal in the MRI was under, brought under control. But then at four months, catastrophe. We've seen pull out of the lower screws of the of the plate. We've seen extrusion of the cylinder. We can, we can also see some degree of collapse of the C6 vertebral body. And at, this is also important. The erythrocyte uh, sedimentation rate was still above 120. So we have to rethink our strategy and ask ourselves what went wrong. Was it a matter of sagittal imbalance? Uh, was infection ongoing? Did we have a patient with poor, poor bone quality? The reconstruction was inappropriate, the concert was short, or was it lack of posterior support? Okay, so what went wrong? People. Okay, so I think we have a problem here because the questions they should be uploaded one by one. And you have people already voted here, and some of them thought that it was ongoing infection, uh, poor bone quality, uh, inadequate anterior vertebral body reconstruction, and short construct. And 20% thought it was the lack of uh, posterior support. Okay. Um, yeah, could be very good. So it actually might be a matter of some of them, not just only one of them individually. So we've had, oh, here we see the results. Okay. So again, a, a, a very tight split between B and C about the ongoing infection, poor bone quality, and they actually might be related towards each other as we might see. So looking back, reviewing the, the original MRIs, we could see that there was some affliction of the posterior tension band as well. So we have a case with 360 instability, not just the front, but also at the back. And um, naturally the, the poor quality, the poor bone quality that an infection will bring into the into this situation will mean that there's a higher chance of pulling out uh, the screws. Mm -hmm. Naturally, there's also technical issues at hand. The the, the plate might, have, might not have been enough floor doses for it, the, the screws, or were not uh, fully uh, put, put in and uh, they were not divergent enough, divergent enough. We did not use bone graft in the cage, which obviously would not allow it. So faced with these realities, what would be your uh, solution to, to solve the case? How would you solve it? Would you do an anterior revision only with a titanium mesh filled with bone and longer construct? Um, and anterior uh, plus, revi plus posterior revision with a short or longer construct. What would be the option? So, so the last poll. So what to solve the problem now? We ended up 
Go so on. most of the people, the people who answered here, think that uh, an anterior revision should be done plus a long uh, posterior fixation. Long posterior fixation. Okay. So these are the results. Exactly. Okay. We ended up going for the middle solution, a shorter posterior fixation, which chose not to go into the into the thoracic spine. Um, the, the the lack of bone quality is mostly localized at the at the levels with the with the infection. Uh, the rest of the we're considering a 55 year old lady. She does not have osteoporosis. She had uh, hormone replacement previously, so we stopped. We considered that it was enough to to stop at C7 with pedicle screws, and we reconstructed at the front with a longer cylinder with a longer plate. And at 12 months, the the construct was holding its own. And as a bonus, we ended up finding out that besides the staph aureus that we found right at the beginning of the case, we also had a mycobacterium tuberculosis isolation in a pulmonary nodule. So it might have been a TB case from the, from the beginning, uh, not just a regular, as we can, if you can say, it, staph aureus case. So the, when, when faced with a patient, as Professor Dr. Liu has already mentioned in this, in this fantastic lecture, when faced with a patient with multi-level pathology, severe bone loss, kyphotic deformity, um, posterior column uh, affliction, it is wise to think from the beginning the, to go for a 360 construct. And that would be probably the overall tactic that we think that would change about our tactics. So uh, when faced with 360 instability, which we failed to see, in the, in the beginning, uh, there was a neglect of the posterior tension band. Uh, an expandable cylinder does not allow for proper bone infusion. You barely can't put any bone in. And there's also the question of the proper placement of the interior plate. So these would be the, the three issues that I would like to, to, to focus on when uh, looking back at this case. Okay. Okay, Rui. Thank you. Good, good. Thank you for for a nice presentation. I think it's a very it's a it's a case that illustrates very nicely the challenges of uh, spondylodiscitis. Um, so, Danny, I think you you had a case like this one, uh, and I guess you have done it from the beginning, 360, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, any further comments from from this case? I would actually have a question, if possible. Um, so uh, you, want, your... you, you, you deliver the lecture and you want to make questions? I do, if possible. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Ryu, in, the, in your very thorough presentation, I'd like to commend you on, the, on that one. Um, most of the cases which you presented have a lot of fibular graft in them. Uh, what is your preference in terms of, of grafting of reconstruction solutions for the interior? Uh, do you always go with fibular if possible or would you consider a mesh cylinder with bone or even expandable cylinder, considering the specific situation of a, of a patient, specific pathologies, for example. Yeah, my usual, the most common graft that I use when I just do the anterior alone is uh, iliac crest, fresh frozen iliac crest allograft. Uh, if I do a, like a two level corpectomy, I use a fibula, fresh frozen fibula allograft. If I'm doing multiple level anterior and posterior, it doesn't really matter what you put in. I think you can put in peak cages, uh, you could put in mesh cages, because it'll heal with the front back. And, uh, and it's faster to use uh, a standalone cage uh, when you're doing a front back than it is to cut the graft, because otherwise I have to take the iliac crest, I have to cut it, shape it, and put it in. Uh, whereas I say, uh, give me an eight millimeter, 18 by uh, uh, 16 cage, and then I just put one in at each level. It's much faster. So, um, and if you're doing multi-level corpectomy and you're backing up posteriorly, I don't think it matters whether you use an expandable cage or a mesh cage or a fibula or uh, whatever. They they will heal very well um, uh, in most patients. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any any further question or remark about this case? I think that uh, is this kind of cases is so important the biological view of these patients. If we put only even this kind of, uh, of devices so we, to obtain the reconstruction of the anterior column, is, uh, the failure is so easy. Uh, mm -hmm. if in, in this in the infection, we need to clean and we, we can afford the biologic 
if we don't make this, we, 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 we have to fail, sure. Okay, Tony, thank you. Tony, I think we should go ahead with your presentation. So let yes. me introduce uh, Antonio Martin Benlock, is an MD, PhD, a senior specialist in trauma orthopedic surgeon at also University Hospital, Dr. Peset in Valencia. He's chief of the, the, the spine unit. Is associate professor of uh, traumatology in Valencia University, and is the president elect of uh, GER, which is the, the, the Spanish Society for for the study of uh, of the spine column. So please go ahead, Tony. Go ahead. So I think it's not so complex cases what we are seeing before, but sometimes we need to think that on all the patients had the same situation. This is a case around the rugby. Uh, you saw, uh, you see the rugby, there are some pictures. Uh, one of the scrum could be probably one of the principal issues in the front of the row and uh, the hookers. Then we can have the, the problems coming home and from the tackling, uh, habitually. Uh, sorry, sorry. Now, if uh, there are some uh, papers uh, published about the, the, what is the, the mechanism of the injury, and they, they say the majority of them in the rugby are in inferior levels, C4, C5, C5, C6, probably is the majority of them, and the hyperflexion extension uh, uh, mechanism. And it depends on the, the, where is the post of the, the, the uh, players on the, on the, of the, of the team. And, but uh, as you can see in this paper, the majority are in the scrum, in the, fr in, in, in the front row, who is the majority of the people that they have. But not always is the same. If uh, we are going to the, 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 the case, it's a very uh, good player. It's a 17 years old male rugby player, uh, junior from the national team in Spain. Is, uh, but he is playing with, uh, with the senior teams in his local team. In the, he's playing in the national division. He's uh, the scrum half, and as uh, could be, uh, typically it's a shorter stature, but it's very strong, very, it's, uh, very quickly. Well, he suffered a, a double tackle uh, coming from two opponents, one from behind, uh, taking on the neck, the type that we say a tie and another from the, in, in the front, to the level of the pelvis. Uh, after this, uh, received this, uh, this double tackle, uh, is, uh, he started with a uh, dissestation in the four limbs. He referred like a cramp a few instances of duration, and he was uh, reported by the field, of the, doc in the, with the field doctor, and he uh, had this spread in the time with the ambulance arrived to the, to the field. With a, very, a medical uh, bed uh, and cervical, with cervical immobilization, it was referenced to a, a hospital center to review it. They don't have uh, x-rays, they have uh, directly going to the CT scanner. Uh, this is the, 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 that we don't see uh, so well by the older device to, to control the neck uh, between C5, C6. And this is the picture of the CT scanner. As we could see, we have five typical flexion distraction in, uh, with uh, these three 30 degree of uh, uh, local and angulation of the, of the, uh, and we could see how are the, in both sides, the, the facets in both sides is not, uh, uh, it, it looks at, they are, they are perched. This is the MRI that they, um, they are performing after that we could see that this is like uh, completely in the place, but uh, there are some uh, posterior affectation of the posterior longitudinal ligament, and this all big uh, amount of edema around the broken uh, posterior, uh, posterior elements of, of the cervical spine. And these are the different pictures of the MRI that we could see when shown the tail. This is the, the pictures of the facets getting the same uh, things. They, they are the, so big, big recommendation to use uh, to, to, to see, to, to, to evaluate how are the, the posture elements that could be very important to decide what will be the, the position of the patient. We use habitually the slick to so injury. This patient is not uh, with the, the neurological status is, is good. There are no problem, but the, the, this colligamentous complex is, is uh, affected. And if we are going to the our, our spine, subaxial cervical spine, probably we can classify this like a subtype B2, 
with complete disruption, disruption or separation of the posterior capsular ligandos uh, without uh, bone uh, fractures. And uh, well, this is the, the, the this classification. And so it will be the first question. In this type of flexion distraction injury without bone injury, it could be sufficient anterior approach once the reduction has been obtained. Posterior approach in case of no reduction with instrumentation, anterior after, I don't know, or try to make an anterior, or unique posterior approach, or double anterior and posterior approach. This will be the question. Oscar? You can launch the question. Uh, as in the bottom, yes. you can launch the questions yourself, please. Yes, go ahead. So yeah, just launch, launch the question. No, you can. Yes. This is the this is the question. What the, there are four options to to perform the patient. Okay, because uh, I'm not co-host anymore. John took me out. But in yes. the bottom, you can yes. you can you can launch the question. Well, I we decided to perf to, to, to make it a double approach, anterior and posterior approach okay. in this case. We make a uh, Smith Robinson with a plate and posterior with uh, facets, uh, blocks, and arthrodesis in the posterior way. In the type B2 instable is one of the options that we can meet it with our subaxial spine classification the recommendation. After four months, we can obtain a good uh, fusion. And this is the MRI of control of the patient. This is the picture, and this is the CT scanner nine months after the surgery where we can the bridges between the both uh, vertebral bodies and the, between the facets. This is the uh, coronal view in both sides. And uh, the, the, uh, one of the things important to, to in, in, there are some papers this, uh, about the, the, what is the, the, the mechanism of the, these injuries in the, in the rugby players. And probably there is a buckling of the cervical spine column, and they say that uh, if the flexion and extension is not clear, it's only a hyperflexion of these patients. And it seems that uh, the, 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 is the, because the fourth vectors with, uh, are significant in compressive components produced to the spinal jury, and they show quickly between two and 20 milliseconds. And the reflex time to the muscular support in the cervical spine are between 50 and 65 milliseconds. So there are no negative uh, protective uh, from the muscles to, to cover the cervical spine. And one, I think one important uh, question for this kind of uh, um, big players or, or, uh, uh, or, or players, they are even professionals. What will be the possibility for these patients? Is an elite sportman with uh, this kind of surgery. So we can meet it with them. Is uh, private the continuity of the contact sport? And uh, we can make to, uh, if there's any degree of neurological involvement, no continuity of the sport. It depends on the state of the cervical spine. So we can, and uh, stenosis and uh, congenital stenosis of cervical spine, what is the amount of, of changes in around, what is the, the length of, of, the, of the injury? Or with proper preparation and physical therapy, we can uh, restart the sport practice with a consensual de decision between the player and the medical team. Okay, very good. So this this time worked. So this these are the the results. So most of the people feel that the, the 20, 37 percent feel that with proper preparation and physical therapy, it is possible to restart uh, sports practice. But still, a quarter of them prohibit the continuity of sports contact. And if there is any degree of neurological involvement, certainly mandatory to stop. Yes. Okay, very good. So what was your advice, Tony? So this patient is all his life, even with 18 years that he has today, is playing rugby. He's playing rugby for the nine years. And uh, she wants to, is, uh, he has uh, gone sometimes, several times to the national team. And all his life is the, this is sport. I'm sorry, but it's, it's like this. And I think that the, 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 with one, one level who is, uh, I think, uh, well, if we have another problem, could be a, a bad con uh, advice, but I think the patient can, and he's uh, starting to, to, to play another time, probably. We discuss with him and with the family. It's crazy. Very nice. So you finished, Tony? 
Yes, yes, he finished. Okay. But I, I would like to know what is the, the opinion of the rest of the, of the, of the friends exactly, of, the, exactly, of, the, exactly. of, so, of this. Then, the, I mean, Dan, do, do you have any, any NFL uh, guidelines for this kind of injury? Yeah, so if somebody has a, a complete neurologic recovery from their injury like this, and, uh, and they solidly fuse at uh, uh, one or two levels, um, you, we let them return to playing football. At three levels, uh, they no longer can play American football. Um, and uh, so one or two level ACDFs or front backs, uh, we, we allow uh, return to play. Good. Tony, but your, your choice here of uh, doing a 360 was because he was a sports player or in a normal individual, you would have done the same operation. Uh, it, 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 I probably I will perform only anterior approach if the, the bone is the, from one quality and the damage is coming from another side. If we will look independent of this, if we, if we see the, the MRI, there are catastrophic the posterior elements are uh, disruption. And uh, for me, in a, a regular patient, I perform a double anterior and posterior approach. I think so. I think so. Okay. So I have here uh, Professor Salah from uh, Cairo, Egypt. Egypt. Osam, how are you doing, my friend? Yes, I'm very well, thank you, Oscar. Do you have any comments on this case? What you would do? What you would do? Rugby, rugby is not popular in Egypt. No, no, it's what not. What you would but do? I, I've actually um, worked in the UK for a couple of years, and uh, what I would suggest that he can go back to rugby but avoid scrums. You know, this hyperflexion injury in, while in the position of the scrum is actually relatively dangerous. Um, and that's why I would suggest him he can go back but avoid scrums. I don't know whether this is technically possible while playing uh, rugby, but um, uh, that would be my advice, really. Okay, thank you. Tony? Well, the, the, the scrum... Uh, the scrum could be probably more than more the majority of the patients coming for, with problems. But there are some studies that uh, uh, they are changing the, in the 2000, 2005, they are, uh, they, they, they are changing a little bit how is the appointment of the two teams to put the head in the place. And there are, uh, there are a good paper published in the, by the French uh, Union to that the, the amount of people coming from the uh, the front uh, the front row who are the and the, the hookers that are the, probably the more in risk are diminishing with uh, this uh, situation because there are three time three uh, three uh, start uh, steps that is marked by the referee if, if it is, uh, there are, it diminishes a lot of the, the amount of uh, of, uh, of lesions and injuries in patients of plug and rugby. Very good. Any further question regarding uh, Tony cases? Yes, if, if you allow me, I, I would like to, sure. to you are, introduce. You are you are <laughs> yes, <German. laughs> I would like to introduce some doubts about it. It's obvious that this case has been well done and well resolved, but if you think about the history of, of cervical spine surgery, I think that 40 years ago, this case uh, will have been resolved with a widening technique, only by posterior. This is 40 years ago, no? Probably 20 years ago, and especially in Europe, with the influence of French people, French surgeons, we will, we will resolve it with an anterior approach. And now, because we have this kind of well devices, the polyaxial screws, etc., for this we perform it a front and back uh, surgery. I would like to, th to, to know the, the opinion of the panelists, or especially about Dan Reef. It's obvious that today we will use a, a double approach, no? But years ago, probably only a posterior approach. What do you think about it? Uh, I, yeah, I think that uh, you're absolutely right. In the past, we would uh, uh, use uh, triple uh, wiring techniques with spinous process wires. And if you don't have a big disc rupture in the front, that would work out uh, perfectly fine. And the patients who would uh, do very well, 
Um, I think that um, uh, what that says is that if you have a stable spine that fuses, that often that's enough. And even if you have a minor neurologic deficit with a fusion, it usually goes away. Um, and uh, so that's a very good point. We don't use spinous process cables a lot anymore and wires because uh, they're not very strong. And I've had patients that I've uh, put in wires in the past. I had a patient I did an ACDF on. They had a pseudarthrosis. So I went in, just put a loop of wire there, and that was it. And then they bent their neck forward, snapped their spinous process, and then I had to go back in a third time to do the, uh, the third operation with lateral mass screws. And I think that's why lateral mass screws are a little bit better because they're a little bit more secure because this patient is so unstable that if you wire them 98 99% of the time with a collar, they'll do fine. But every once in a while, you have somebody who takes off the collar, bends their neck forward, snaps their spinous process, and then you have loss of correction. And so that's, I think, uh, the benefit of uh, using uh, lateral mass screws as opposed to uh, wires. Thank you. Okay, I think we're going to move, move on to uh, Claudio Tatsui. Claudio is a good friend also. He's an associate professor in neurosurgery at the MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, Claudio has his practice uh, limited to spine tumors. He's it, a rising star in the field of tumor surgery in the spine. And Claudio, yes. could you please share your... Yep, just a minute here. Um... I should do it. All right. Can you guys okay. see it? It's right. Perfect. It's perfect. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oscar, for the invitation. Uh, you know, I congratulate all the previous speakers. It's been a wonderful morning. You're learning a lot. Um, you know, I'm going to be talking about uh, some tumors and. Um, affecting the circular spine where actually two different approaches where I think we need to understand uh, you know the, the, the disease so we can plan the proper reconstruction um, and, um, and so these are basically two patients that we treated over the last uh, seven years and uh, case one is a younger lady with a history of breast cancer but overall controlled after a mastectomy developed some neck pain and uh, had an MRI that demonstrated that lesion that you guys can see on the left side. It's a lesion uh, involving a C4. And then I'm gonna show another case of a older gentleman, 85 years old, who uh, presented neck pain. And uh, you know, had an investigation overall, CT chest abdominal was negative, prior history of prostate cancer, and uh, was also uh, sent to us. You can see a I'm gonna go for the first one, uh, uh, bigger images here. You can see this is a lesion that is hyper intense, has uh, a, a component of soft tissue involving the anterior, uh, bulging anterior to the body of C4, but there is in the, you know, also invasion of the bone uh, on C4, relatively contained within a pseudo capsule, right? And um, this is the second case where you see a completely different story. So this is a, still an anterior uh, lesion involving not one, but now three levels. Same pattern of invasion in the bone, not necessarily contained by a pseudo capsule. You can see kind of here that things get a little blending and it kind of involves bilateral vertebral arteries here, right? So it's a totally different story. It might be the same histology, but these are not the same staging. And uh, we, we need to understand and recognize that when we plan our treatment. So what's next? Uh, very easy, this is, we need a biopsy. We need to know what we're dealing with. And uh, the first case uh, came to us without a prior biopsy. So we did a biopsy and it was a chordoma. The second case, just to make our decision making easier, that patient had been already performed, someone performed an interior approach and did an open biopsy on that patient. And that has been also confirmed to be chordoma. So we're dealing with two chordomas here. And um, I'm gonna put this to vote now, what would be the best approach for the first case, the one that has a single level involvement of C4 with a relatively preserved pseudo capsule. That's what we call any kin 1B staging. What would be the best approach for this patient?
So anybody who do an intraregional resection uh, uh, and block resection, radiation therapy with conventional radiation, radiation therapy with stereotactic radiosurgery, radiation therapy with proton therapy or surgery, kind of an intralesional resection followed by radiation. All right. Okay, so looks like. Okay, so we're gonna close it here. Uh -huh. Share. So far, it, seems, it seems most of the people would go for surgery and, and block resection. Okay, all right, very good. Uh, let me close this. So, yeah, that that would be my my answer. This is a lesion that we is contained within a pseudo capsule, and if we perform resection uh, without violating that capsule, we can cure that pain. Right. So. Planning of this surgery is, is complex, it's not easy. So you need to answer a couple of questions. First question is that you need to ask yourself, is a true and block resection with clean margins really feasible? You know, this is the most important because if you violate the capsule, I'm gonna show the results are basically defeat the purpose of all this, uh, this effort. So the second question is the morbidity acceptable. This is a young patient, the other one was an older patient, you know, 85 versus 45. So putting someone through a major operation at that on older age might not be, you know, as uh, easy or as straightforward as someone younger who has many more years to live. Uh, you know, can the patient endure surgery, right? Is the comorbidity something that will preclude a good result? And uh, this, the, then you need to ask, uh, to answer other questions like, is the bone and soft tissue attachments? How can you plan your surgery so you remove that bone and block without disconnecting that piece of the spine, uh, what are the attachments and uh, what's the, the insertions of ligaments and soft tissue that needs to be resected? Is the patient gonna have problems with soft tissue, tissue coverage? Are we gonna have to call plastic surgery? Do we need to do a vascularized bone graft? All these uh, needs to be thought very well before and uh, you know, so you can have a durable reconstruction. Doesn't work, it's not worth it to just remove the tumor and have a failed or a wound that never healed. So, all these questions need to be answered and planned ahead so you can have a successful result. Uh, so just a little review on the literature. This is uh, one of the best papers. Uh, you know, you see the author here. Everybody who is part of this uh, authorship here, is, here has is the, the largest experience in this planet with this type of procedures. And even on their hands, you can see that the ones that underwent a resection with adequate margins, like the showing here, where we can remove the tumor contained by the pseudo capsule, they had a better outcome than uh, the ones that were violated. And uh, the advantage is uh, significant at uh, five and 10 years in terms of survival, in terms of, of, of local disease control. So when we do these surgeries, what we be needing to do, right? So this C4 tumor, the connections are the pedicle, also elements, the transverse process, and the discs. Right, so we need to disconnect basically from uh, uh, the anterior annulus, the disc, the posterior annulus. We need to disconnect the pedicles and the transverse process. So, just showing this view here, this is uh, everybody is very familiar with this. This is a laminectomy with foraminotomies, and uh, you can see that we basically have the root right above the pedicle. And if we remove the lateral mass, we can still maintain that relationship and we can then perform a drilling of this pedicle. If you disconnect the pedicle on both sides, you have now a second attachment that you can get from posterior as well, which is the anterior uh, uh, lim limit of the transverse foramen. The, the, the relationship of the vertebral artery is important. So the vertebral artery is located anterior to the nerve root and lateral to the pedicle. So if you stay in line with the pedicle, you can enter a carison or an osteotome here and you can then perform an anterior osteotomy here bilaterally of the transverse process. And then you can go from a second stage in the front and then uh, perform a disectomy above and below. And that uh, you know, disconnects the tumor and you can remove it uh, in a single piece. And this is the final uh, image here on the, on the right side where we, we had the tumor completely resected. Uh, this is uh, a cut 
So we sent uh, the tumor for pathology and they, they processed and you can see that we were able to remove this tumor. There is a uh, marginal margin here in the esophageal aspect, but we were able to not violate this tumor and uh, that was the best operation that can be done for, the, for such a patient. Um, this is the final reconstruction. We went from the front and from the back because we completely disconnected the entire, uh, you know, there is no connections. We have to perform a, a 360 degree reconstruction. Uh, this is almost eight years since the operation and this patient is doing very well. And um, so now I'm gonna go for the second patient, which is a little, same histology, but completely different in terms of uh, anatomy location, right? So. This case here is a completely different story. We have, even in the, I, I would say it's impossible because there is involvement of the bilateral vertebral arteries. And uh, even if you sacrifice one vertebral artery, you're gonna compromise your margin on the other side. So this, this is something that, in my opinion, can't be removed and blocked without violating this, uh, this little capsule. And has been already biopsied, so uh, I think it would be already uh, an in-block resection would not be, I mean, it's gonna defeat the purpose, right? So, I would like to put to vote what would be the best option in this situation here. Okay, so Claudio, some we had already people that voted. Okay. And they think also that for, for this case, particular case, uh, the surgery and unblock recession would be the best uh, the best solution. Very good, very good. So all right, so let me tell you that I think that because the block resection, a true and block resection can be performed, I think that's not the right call. This is an older gentleman that's gonna have significant morbidity of a three level uh, vertebrectomy here. And if you leave disease behind, I'm gonna show what happens. So I would be inclined to treat this patient with other modalities. Uh, uh, actually for this gentleman, we elected proton therapy. Looks like proton uh, radiation. I'm going to explain a little, but the heavy particle uh, has a, uh, you can concentrate a higher dose uh, protecting the surrounding tissues because the fall off of the heavy particle allows uh, less toxicity to tissues and you can go to a higher dose of radiation. Stereotactic radiosurgery is a very good option. However, it's very close to esophagus and toxicity to the esophagus might be an issue when you give a single fraction radiation there. And uh, surgery for a, a, a partial or an intralegional resection followed by radiation is a, is a good option. And then uh, there is a paper from MGH that I'm gonna show the results where uh, that, that also should, could be a potential uh, approach here. So basically what we done was uh, proton therapy. So I have here uh, the first time I saw this patient, then I had uh, treated him with proton therapy here in 18. And you can see that the tumor didn't do much on three months, didn't do much on six months, didn't do much on uh, almost a year after. And then when I saw him back in um, August, uh, we saw that the tumor starts shrinking, but then he developed a fracture here on C4 and he was having neck pain. So uh, at this stage here, you know, I felt that we are obtaining the local control that we, we would like to see, but we're failing the anterior column here. So my strategy here, was to perform a C2 to, uh, a C2 to T1 posterior cervical fusion. And actually that, uh, that was, I'm gonna show a little bit later this. So just to show our uh, results, we named, in MD Anderson, we do see between the chordomas of the, of, the, of the clavus, mobile spine and lumbar spine, probably at least one per week, I would say three per month, between three to four per month. And uh, you know, I'm getting very interested on this histology because it's a very challenging problem. So um, uh, this is a paper we're looking now in preparation. We have 50 cases of the sacrum cordomas, okay? And uh, we noted, so 50 cases here. We had nine cases where our pathology specimen demonstrated an inappropriate resection, meaning we violated the capsule. We had 41 cases where we didn't violate the capsule. The capsule was resected in, uh, intact. So out of these 41, 26 patients never recurred, which is a very good result. However, 13 patients had a recurrence, not immediately adjacent to the tumor, but nearby the tumor. Okay, so, uh, and, uh, so even by doing an N-block resection that was confirmed by, by experienced neuropathologists to be 
oncologically appropriated, we still had 31% of recurrences, which is really not ideal, right? And if you do an inappropriate resection, almost everybody recurred here. So um, 80, 80, 80 plus percent of recurrence. So even by doing a, a complete resection, we have 31% of local recurrences of these cordomas. So this is the paper where uh, they explored uh, surgery in combination with radiation. And that's the best paper, the best series that I, I, I am aware of. So 126 patients. Uh, part of the radiation was given before the surgery. 50 grades, and then a uh, patient undergoes an uh, end block resection. And after the resection, they, there is a boost of 20 grades in the operative field. So, with this, the intention is trying to they destroy cells that eventually already migrated outside of the initial lesion. And um, they are showing here that uh, survival is significantly better if you don't violate the capsule. And uh, the local control is also significantly better. So if you do a surgery and you violate the capsule, even if you give given radiation in the post-op, you still have very suboptimal results here. The biggest problem with this uh, uh, approach is the wound complication rate is really an issue. Wound dehiscence, wound breakdown, hardware failure, especially after five years becomes really problematic. So uh, not, a, not a good solution uh, uh, yet. So uh, then the same group uh, performed a review of 40 patients there where they treated just with uh, proton therapy. Okay, so no surgery. They just gave the maximum dose of proton therapy and a uh, smaller population, 40 cases, but they did uh, long follow-up and uh, the local control in five years, 80%. Looks pretty good. Problem with Cordoma is that we need more time. Five years is not enough. We need to have 10 years 15 years, so we have a better idea. With surgery, we do have this natural history, and we know that some of the patients we can really cure if you do a true and block resection. I'm not sure we're looking into a true cure with uh, radiation, but the data is coming, and uh, this, is a, this is something that we're gonna have a better understanding in a few, few more years. Even these guys here, they had eight patients that developed distant metastasis, even without touching, with, uh, with imaging showing the tumor to be radiographically silent, this thing still can metastasize, so it's not totally there. Um, and then this is another uh, modality of heavy particle is uh, carbon ion. We don't have this in the United States. In Europe, there is a couple of centers in Japan as well. This is the Italian group uh, uh, with analysis of 188 cases, which is a pretty good number, showing you know, imaging control and showing around 77% of local control in five years, dropping to 52% in 10 years. So it's cases where you're not gonna be able to remove this end block. This, I think this approach here with heavy particle radiation seems to be at least similar to, to an, an attempt uh, of a maximum surgical resection with probably less morbidity. So uh, problem is that I don't know if we're talking the same language when we talk about local control in this situation. This is on the left side here, we have a, a sacral cordoma that we resect and block, and uh, this is the recurrence. So we follow this for a couple of years, and then maybe three, four years later, we see something here, boom, we call it a recurrence, okay? When you give radiation to these folks, we are not sure because this, for instance, this is a nice paper about uh, proton therapy, and they show two year follow up, showing that, yes, the tumor reduced in size, but I'm not sure in the bottom of the sacral here in the coccyx, if you see the pre-radiation and now, there is a change here. And they are not calling a recurrence because the volume of the tumor is smaller. But yes, on the surgical group here, my volume is small as well, but I see something here and I'm calling a recurrence. These guys are not calling a recurrence. So is the results with radiation really what they're reporting? I don't know, we don't know. We need to have a better uh, you know, uh, understanding of this. So I'm looking to my case here. I have no regrets to have radiated this guy. I have no regrets to intervene when he had a fracture and he became symptomatic. I still decided not to go resect it. We performed a posterior surgical fusion. The patient is actually doing very well. His pain is improved and he's doing very well from 85 years old. He has a full quality of life at that age. And um, this is the best axial that I can show you guys. To me, 
I think that this is very similar, but you see the back of the body here on C4 is being involved here. So I, I, we are, our radiologists are still calling this disease stable, but I am keeping an eye on here because I don't know, I'm having second thoughts if we are still stable here. And have I done an intralesional resection here, would I have had a different result? I don't believe I would have had a different result. So far, we need to learn more on how we're gonna attack radiate, how we have to treat these tumors. I think the most important factor is if the tumor is already contained by the pseudo capsule or is it spread from the pseudo capsule. So in conclusion, um, messages, take home messages. So surgery any appropriate resection and block resection is the preferred method to achieve long uh, interval free of disease. There is no question about it. Uh, if a surgical resection with appropriate margins is not feasible, and you need to be honest with yourself if you are going to be achieving this. Even in the most experienced hands, when you not achieve an block resection, 80% of tumor recurs, and sometimes in less than a year, you already see the recurrence. Radiation is promising, uh, you know, however, we need to give higher doses. You need to get to a high biological dose. You need to be more than 70 grays, otherwise uh, this tumor is not gonna respond. And um, therefore, that's why stereotactic radiosurgical or, uh, or uh, heavy particle is uh, appropriate for this. Uh, the pre-op adjuvant radiation seems to increase the local control to the surgery, but wound complication is a real problem. And uh, intralegional resection, Mark Bielski, my friend from New York, from Sloan Kettling, uh, is publishing a lot on, on, on resections followed by stereotactic radiosurgery. But still anecdotic, it's still very limited series. I don't know. I think it's an alternative, but needs to be better studied. And uh, I think the real uh, benefit will, will come when we understand what tumor tends to recur and what, their, what tumor tends to have a more aggressive behavior based on maybe molecular markers. So a lot of work has been, is being ongoing on trying to identify uh, risk factors or molecular markers to point towards a more aggressive versus a less aggressive. So if you have a more aggressive tumor, maybe it makes sense to do a more aggressive surgery to try to remove it. If you have a less aggressive tumor, maybe you can do a more economic or a less invasive option like radiation for these tumors. Thank you. That, thanks, Ivan. Thank you, thank you Claudio. It was a really nice presentation. So uh, here, histology really makes the difference. You have uh, two tumors that uh, apparently they look alike, but uh, the histology made the difference in the management, and I think this was really clear. I, I just would like to hear Tony Martin's opinion because uh, himself is a, a really a tumor expert in, in, in Spain, and he does a lot of tumor uh, spine surgery. So, Tony, would you have managed this kind of uh, situations the same? I think that I probably yes, because uh, they are two completely different. The amount of complications uh, in the second case uh, with the age of the patient, uh, no sense to, to perform it. So a big uh, story like that, uh, with the, uh, we have the possibilities to make the, this kind of prothon uh, carbon ion therapy could be enough in this kind of patients. In the first patient, uh, I think it's the, the, the surgery in block uh, is not uh, so big, uh, well, it's half some details but I think it's the, the correct situation. Probably now we are trying to put uh, in the front more uh, carbon fiber to perform uh, a radiotherapy if we need it after, even with the anterior plate with carbon fiber. Posterior, we don't have it. We don't, we, we don't have this kind of hardware, uh, but we will diminish the, the amount of, uh, of, uh, of uh, hardware in metal uh, with titanium could be better to try to move uh, if we need uh, posteriorly these patients. But with the, with, I completely agree if the, with the Hennequin uh, is appropriate or not, it's one of the issues that we need to, to employ in this kind of patients. Uh, with the, it's not the same, the, the basis of the cranium or cervical or mobile spine or, on, of the sacrum. But then this kind of tumor is low degree, but uh, the history of them with the patients is long, long history and come back with the even with the after you are performing the very good uh, uh, surgery with uh, the margin are free but uh, it's coming another time uh, it's very bad issue to to work with them completely agree with the, with the solution thank you tony then uh up to you now uh, you are an expert in tumor surgery as well so 
would you have done the same situation uh, in the 360k fusion? You would you have extended up and down, uh, or just the same construct? I would have used uh, an identical construct. Uh, the tumor is very well localized, and um, uh, so you're going to get local spread as opposed to uh, uh, METs with this uh, um, uh, tumor and with uh, uh, proton beam uh, therapy. And I agree completely with the second patient also. He's 85. He's had a history of prostate cancer and uh, an extensive uh, uh, removal with uh, vertebral artery uh, involvement, you're not going to achieve much with surgery. So um, I, I totally agree. Okay. Any, any other comment on this case? Okay. If, if not, let's, let's move to the, to the next speaker. And I call um, Geronimo Milano. Is uh, from Brazil. Is director of spine division in the Neurological Institute of uh, Curitiba. Is director of of, of um, Brazilian Department of uh, of Spine of the Brazilian uh, Neurosurgical Society, and is the current AO chairman for uh, for AO Spine chairman for Brazil. Uh, please go ahead, Jeremy. Okay. Uh, can you uh, can you see my screen? Perfect. Uh, so, so thanks a lot once again for uh, this invitation. It's an honor to be here with this dream team of uh, panelists, and uh, I'm gonna show you a case of late post-traumatic kyphotic deformity. Uh, this is the case summary: is a 41 years old female who have a history of falling from three meters one year before. And it's quite interesting because she had no diagnosis at the time of the trauma. You can see on the right the, the x-ray she made in, at the, the, the day of the trauma. Uh, you can see there is some uh, uh, changes on alignment over here. But because of the patient's habitus, probably uh, they are not able to uh, see the, 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 the bottom of the cervical spine. Uh, and she presented with chronic cervical pain and some irradiation to the right shoulder, no specific uh, radiculopathy. Uh, there was some complaint about bilateral hypoesthesia. She uh, has hypertension, some obesity, and was a smoker. On physical exam, we could see a uh, limited range of motion, um, most in flexion, cervical pain during flexion and palpation, there were no motor deficits, uh, some uh, hypoesthesia, bilateral hyperreflexia, and bilateral Hoffman sign. And this is the x-ray one year after the trauma. And here you can see a subluxation in C5, C6 with a uh, very wide interspinal, uh, interspinal uh, space and the facet joint is uh, probably locked. We're not so sure if it's fused or not, uh, but we cannot see uh, many movements on flexion or extension. And here we have the sagittal CT scan. On the left, probably the facet is not totally fused, but here on the right, you can see that it's probably fused. We have some disc spaces over here. It's probably not fused in the disc space. And we can see there is um, possibly a, a, a little fracture in the C5 vertebral body as well. Here we have the MRI. So there is some uh, spinal cord compression, but there is no uh, changes in spinal cord sinus. Again, uh, injury of the posterior complex ligament, but you cannot see a uh, huge spinal cord compression. Here the steer and the axle. Again, not a huge cord compression. So the first question I want to put for uh, the audience and for the panelists as well is about how would you approach this situation, try to do anterior only, 
double approach, start, uh, I mean a front and back, or a double approach, back and front, or even a triple approach, starting from posterior, then anterior, and uh, finally posterior. I don't know if you are able to vote. If not, uh, if there is someone uh, between the panelists who can comment a little bit. People are voting, Geronimo. Ah, okay, great. Just allow another more seconds. Okay, I'm gonna close it. So, regarding the approach, 47% uh, would do a double approach, anterior first and posterior. Uh, okay. A quarter of them would do an anterior approach only, and uh, double, posterior, anterior, triple would be less, less uh, um, chosen. And regarding the, because people voted already, regarding yeah, the, okay. the many levels for anterior correction, uh, people also think that uh, four, five, and five, six, the second needs to, to be done. And almost the same would feel a C5 copectomy. Okay. Okay, let's go ahead. Yep. Uh, anybody yep. want to comment? So that there are two points to, to, to discuss, what to do from anterior and what would be the, the, the approach. I don't know. Uh, Dan, do you have any Dan, comments yep. uh, yeah, about please. this? Yeah, so I've uh, uh, reported on doing um, anterior posterior osteotomies on patients who have this very same problem. And the key is to hyperlordose them and get into that disc space. It really is only the disc that's the problem. And uh, you can uh, get in there, uh, put in Caspar distractor pins, go through the disc space, and then uh, you, you position the patient's head so that it's way up and you push back on the forehead. And doing that, you can actually break that facet uh, uh, that's fused in the back. You put in a standalone cage with just the screws into C2, 3, 4, C5 so that you can get further correction in the back. Then you flip them over, put in lateral mass screws, and then you can correct them in the back. Um, and uh, that would be my choice. But if for some reason you don't feel comfortable doing that, you can also do it with a uh, C6 corpectomy and just go in posteriorly and stabilize them. That also would work and would be simple. Or you can go in posteriorly, go through the facet joints, flip anteriorly, uh, then do the anterior uh, um, uh, discectomy infusion, and then go back in the back and put in screws. So there are a lot of different ways to do it, and it really depends on what you feel most comfortable doing. Okay, Tony. Tony, what's your what's your take? Now, now I think it's, it's open the microphone. I think uh, it, it it depends of the mobility. If there are no mobility, probably we, one of the choice for us it will be posterior first, perform the osteotomy, put the the screw in place, go anteriorly, and make a, a distectomy if it's possible with the caspar, if not the corporectomy. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a triple, a triple uh, approach, I think so, in this case. Andres, Andres, uh, what you would prefer to yes, do? Yes, we, we have been treated similar cases, and um, I agree with the Dan and also with Tony that if, uh, and, and uh, excuse me, and also with Geronimo, that if the if the facets are fused, that it seems that it's fused, or if not fused, it's very rigid. You need to go if you would like to perform a correct correct position and correct lordosis of the cervical spine. You need to go first posterior, make an osteotomy, second anterior do discectomy. I prefer I prefer discectomy uh, with uh, the Casper distraction to put a case and as, as a third approach return to the posterior and fix with the screws. Obviously, Very there good. could be more simpler uh, with other only, but difficult to perform a, a correct, correct reduction. Okay. Do you agree with Oscar? Oh yes. I mean, I think I think everything depends on on. Yeah. It seems that the facet is fused, so this needs to be addressed in, in, first in order to have some correction of the, the deformity. Okay, Jeronimo. So what what have you done? Show us, please. We, we have uh, um, uh, the same questions and uh, 
as in flexion extension x-ray we could not see any movement and in our opinion the the, the facet joint was totally fused at least in in one side we prefer sorry uh, we prefer to do a triple pro approach starting with the the, the screws laminectomy and a wide facetectomy uh, something like a, a smith peterson osteotomy and then go from anterior and we prefer to do the, the, the two discs because I, I'm not so sure if uh, we are able to put a plate <coughs> over here in the, um, the C5 vertebral body and then back to posterior with the rods and some additional compression. Uh, in the postoperative, the patient uh, presented with uh, bilateral C5 palsy, even with a, a wide foraminotomy. We perform a, a, a MRI uh, because we uh, wanted to see if there was any compression, additional compression. We cannot see any compression. And three days after the surgery, the patient uh, already had a partial recovery, grade four or five. And one month after the surgery, she had no deficits at all. This is what we have with the, the correction. You can see the pre-op and post-op uh, anterior x-ray and here the, the lateral view. Uh, the patient is very satisfied, uh, no uh, complaints of pain and no neurological deficit at this moment. Okay, is that all, Jeremy? Yep. Very good, very, very interesting case. So can I have the, the, the comments here from the panel or from the audience? Someone wants to, to join us and make a comment. Daniel, so I understand this would be your, your choice as well. Um, I, I do these as just an anterior followed by a posterior. Uh, you can actually break through that facet from the front because even though it's fused, um, uh, I've got many cases where I've had patients who have a fused uh, facet joint that by using um, uh, pushing on the forehead and uh, distracting intraoperatively that it, uh, you can actually force it to go back and break it in the back. And then you save one step, it saves a little bit of time. And then if you do that, the other advantage is that you only have to do a one level fusion front and back at four, five, uh, I'm sorry, at C5, six. And, uh, uh, but this works beautifully, and the patient uh, had uh, full recovery of their neurologic deficit, so you can't argue with success like that. Good. Yeah, good point. Hossam Salah, again, from Cairo. Yes, Oscar. Yes, yes, thank you, ahead, Oscar. Uh, a great presentation, Geronimo, um, and an excellent outcome, of course. I would actually agree with Dr. Rue. Um, so many of these cases, uh, we often see neglected fractures in our home country. So despite the CT looks like as if it is fused, you may actually not find it, find it fused and you will get more mobility than you think from the front. Uh, so I would, I would actually go on from the anterior first and then go back uh, posteriorly and probably get the, a good result as well. But that is a fantastic outcome, Geronimo. Well done. Oscar, can you, I speak? Thank you very much. Can I speak? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, uh, why, I would why do don't you show your, your video? Uh, sure, uh, sure, sir. Sure. Please, please. Yeah. yeah. Hello, everybody. Hi. Yeah. Okay. I'd rather do C6 corpectomy and uh, do anterior fixation, uh, put a mess and anterior plating. And uh, I think. To do to go posteriorly or not, I think I've decided on the table itself uh, because it's not a, a fresh injury. So I would like to give it a trial of an anterior alone after a cystic corpectomy fusion and fixation. That's my opinion. Can can you please somebody comment on that too? Thank Oscar, you, Oscar. Can I say something in this case? Oh, Juti, hi. We just joined. Yes, please, Liberty. Juti, go go ahead. Juti from uh, from India. Nice to, nice to see all friends, right? Very excellent case. And actually, uh, this is what we discussed uh, in, the, in the last webinar also. Uh, but when the fusion is uh, pretty well established, 
it's, it's pretty difficult sometimes if you go only anterior. As Dan was talking about it, that when you push it back and sometimes it breaks up and slips in and it gets reduced by itself. But uh, in case if it doesn't, if, if, if that does not uh, reduce it, then it is going to be a problem. So I would have done the way what uh, Dr. Milano has done uh, because there is a fusion on one side and the, the other side, the facet, we are not very sure about it. And uh, also uh, the disc material, whatever we see in the anterior, is not very significant and it looks like that it is okay. So it is a pretty, pretty difficult to, uh, to, to, to tie the ropes on the cat. Uh, but I personally feel that, that in case, this is for Dan, in case uh, if the patient is not getting reduced, so what is the option then? Uh, so what we do is um, um, we put in a standalone cage with one screw just into C5. And, uh, and so it's still, let's say it's a little bit sublux and they're still kyphotic. When you go in the back, then if you burrow through the facet joints, it reduces. And because you haven't fixed the C6, uh, but you fix the C5, that cage goes back with C5 and you get a perfect reduction. And uh, so um, uh, we've got many cases like this where the facets are fused, even surgically fixed with rods in the back. We've been able to break through by doing the front first or get partial correction in the front and then go in the back, remove all the rods and screws, go through the facet joint and you get a perfect reduction. And uh, um, and it, it works very nicely if, um, uh, and even people who haven't tried it before who say, how, how can that work? Uh, when, once they try it, they say, wow, it saved me a huge amount of time because I didn't have to do posterior, anterior, posterior. Uh, but even with a posterior facet that's fused and even with screws, if you put in cast bar distractor pins, you go through the disc and you, you can even put two cast bar pins in and if you crank it, you'll take that spine and you'll just bend it through the uh, fusion mass. You put your graft in and even though it's still anterior lesthes like this, you gap it open, you put in the device and when you go in the back, you can reduce it and then it'll fuse and it'll be perfectly aligned. Well, that's, that's very, very nice. I think probably, I think we have to try it that way. It's very interesting, but uh, it definitely has to be taken uh, seriously about this technique. You know, the, the importance is that, you know, you reduce it at a single level. The, the complete surgery get over at a single level rather than doing uh, multiple extension of levels. It's nice, Dan. Thank you, Jyoti. Thank you for, your, for being with us. I have a question here from, from uh, Dr. Shaheen. Uh, he's asking if there is any role for preoperative traction in, the, in this case, Geronimo. Well, I think it's a good idea. Uh, we don't use it, it uh, very uh, often, but it's a good idea exactly to see how reducible is the, the, um, the deformity. Uh, but we, we, did, we didn't perform in this case. Um, we, we are uh, very uh, worried about the patient habitus. Uh, she, she has, she uses, uh, is a smoker. Uh, obese, so put this patient in attraction with a risk of uh, thrombosis. It, 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 it was not a good idea in our opinion at that time, but possibly in, in general cases it can be done. Okay, we have a little time here. You know, I, I know that Andre from Brazil, our friend, is here. Andre, do you have a comment on this case? Andre Joaquin. Hello. Hi, Oscar. Hi, Andre. Good to see you. Good to see you. Nice, nice case from Geronimo. I'm just <laughs> looking here. Well, I, I think uh, uh, if you go interior and you have uh, a lot of experience like Dr. Dan, you're going to save uh, one approach. But otherwise, uh, for, for, for example, if you want to be sure that you, you're going to reduce this a triple ap approach is, uh, uh, I think you have 100% one, of chance, even if you don't have experience. I think uh, both, both ways are correct, but uh, it depends on your experience to do that. I don't have too much experience to reduce from anterior to do anterior osteotomy. So probably I would solve this case like Geronimo, but I, I think it's 
both correct. That it doesn't change too much if it, it, you just uh, 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 have a short procedure if you go anterior and posterior. I think it's just a, a, a matter of experience. Wonderful. So, Jerome, I have a question for you. What do, do you think was the mechanism of the C5 palsy? And have you, could you have done something different? No. Or, uh, even, or even these maneuvers that Dan is talking about from anterior uh, approach to reduce. Uh, um, can you risk something, the, the, the nerve root as well, by doing this anterior approach? Uh, uh, it was quite interesting because uh, we did a, a, a very wide laminectomy and a, a foraminotomy in this case. So uh, we really didn't understand. I don't know if there is any uh, spinal cord trauma during the surgery uh, because probably the mechanism is not the same we have when we do a, a laminoplasty or a laminectomy and fusion by posterior. Uh, I, I don't think it's the same mechanism uh, because we don't have the, the spinal cord shifting uh, in, in this kind of situation. Probably was some direct trauma during the... the um, the, the correction. Geronimo, uh, do you believe that maybe some scar tissue because of the, the, the initial trauma and this is scar tissue when you correct, uh, you put in the right position after a long time, it may also have some influence, not only trauma? Possibly, possibly. Uh, that, that, that's a good uh, uh, idea. Very good. We have here a very, a very, from, from Jake, uh, from England, He's a friend also, Jake Timothy, is asking what are the techniques uh, to prevent uh, dysphagia from anterior cervical surgery then? I think this could be another webinar, but can you try and, and answer, uh, you know, some, some flavor of it? So you have to make sure that uh, you limit how, um, how long it takes you to do the surgery. So the less time you spend, the less dysphagia you get. The more you mobilize the soft tissue so that you don't have to put a lot of pressure in order to retract the anterior structures, the less dysphagia. Uh, patients who, if you use retropharyngeal uh, steroids, uh, that can help, uh, but there is a danger to it. Uh, you wanna use your instrumentation that's very, um, uh, not very prominent. And uh, I also put in, on top of uh, plates some bone wax to make the, um, the plate very smooth. So if you have a very irregularly shaped plate, uh, I think that also increases the dysphagia risk. You want to make sure that the plate is absolutely flush with the bone. Sometimes instead of being like that, at the top you see people uh, whose plate is uh, too proud and that can increase the dysphagia. And uh, so that's another uh, way to prevent it. Um, and if you need to go up to C2-3 or 3-4 and you're not used to doing that, that can injure structures up there and cause more dysphagia. And uh, so uh, you might want to do that from the back instead of from the front. And those are just some of the ways to help prevent it. Thank you. So then, then we are now going for two hours of the webinar. So we need to, to start in, uh, to conclude. So I invite you to show your, your 360Ks on on a regular spondylotic myelopathy, but with a, with a risk factor for pseudoarthrosis, right? Right. Uh, so this is uh, a 26-year-old, two-pack-per-day smoker from Kuwait, and he had numbness, and uh, he had uh, bilateral um, uh, ulnar distribution numbness, and uh, uh, he had uh, a left-sided Hoffman's hyperreflexia, bilateral clonus, a positive Romberg, and uh, difficulty with uh, tandem gait. And you can see he's got, this is a flexion view, extension view, AP, and oblique views. You can see he's got a lot of foraminal stenosis at multiple levels. Uh, he's got mild loss of normal lordosis. Uh, and... Um, And uh, this is his uh, MRI. Uh, this is uh, C3, 4, 4, 5. Uh, this is also C4, 5. This is behind the C5 vertebral body, uh, 5, 6, 6, 7. You can see sort of the sagittal, what it looks like. Um, and so okay. the first uh, question is, what would people do? Would you do an ACDF at C4, 5, 5, 6, 6, 7, a C5 porpectomy, 6, 7, ACDF, Lamy fusion, uh, 
ACDF uh, front back. Um, so um, uh, first thing I'd like to ask is what, what you would do. Okay, so now it's, it's open for voting. Okay, it doesn't seem it's working. Uh, okay. We really have to tune the, oh, oh, it's coming, it's coming, okay. So you, you don't give other options here, Andrew, uh, Daniel. Yeah, so uh, like like uh, like astroplasty. Right. Yeah, I, I thought that his uh, his uh, discs were a little too far gone to do arthroplasty, okay. and okay. he had too much uh, uh, arthritis uh, to do that. Okay. And okay. Uh, and then so, so I basically say, would you do A, B, C, or further studies uh, before doing anything? Okay. So most of the people would say C five perfect to me, and uh, six seven ACDF. Okay. And ACDF four four to seven and posterior fusion. Okay. And then um, so let's um, uh, go on to the next question, which is, um, what do you think is uh, causing uh, the problem? Uh, do you think uh, this is a tumor? Uh, do you think this is a uh, myelopathy due to a large herniated disc? Uh, radiculopathy due to a large herniated disc, none of the above or all of the above? Okay. So, all right. And so most people uh, think, most it's, people uh, think it's from uh, from the large herniated disc. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. And then, uh, so let's go on to the next. Uh, so I didn't do surgery at that point. I got a CAT scan. And what the CAT scan shows is, and this is the importance of a CAT scan, that when you suspect somebody, and I'm going to go back and show you the um, uh, MRI again. If you take a look at this MRI and, um, and you see all of this, this is not the pattern of a herniated disc. And for somebody to have a huge herniated disc at C4-5, going behind the C5 vertebral body and another one at C6-7, uh, it would be very unlikely that you have something like that. So you, when you see something like that, you have to suspect that this is not um, uh, just soft disc material, but that this is something else. And that's why if you don't get the CAT scan, you'll never know and you'll end up uh, going in anteriorly without having proper information. And so I purposely put this uh, case in because I thought that uh, uh, that um, it is very easy to think of this as just a herniated disc. In fact, this is OPLL, and not only is it OPLL, the OPLL is grown from the front and fused to the back, and it's grown into the vertebral foramen here at C4-5, and um, uh, it almost, and, and I don't understand almost how this person can be alive and uh, functional, but, uh, and you can see they're auto-fused here at C2-3, they're auto-fused here at C3-4 and they have severe facet arthrosis, and the amount of stenosis they have into the foramen is phenomenal. How they're not paralyzed on that left side is uh, uh, very difficult for me to understand, but they're not. It's because it grows so slowly. So what would you do at this point surgically? Would you do a laminoplasty, a laminectomy and fusion? Would you do anterior corpectomy? Would you do both a laminectomy and fusion and an anterior corpectomy? Um, so, I think uh, this is a difficult kind of uh, uh, of a case, uh, but um, uh, let's take the poll and see what uh, people would do. Oops. Okay, so most of the people then would go for a laminectomy infusion uh, off of them. Okay. And a minority, 18% uh, for B and C, a combination. Okay. I think uh, that's a very good uh, uh, point of uh, how to do this. Um, uh, if you take a look at uh, studies on uh, treating OPLL, if the occupying ratio, in, in this, the occupying ratio is about 90%. So if it's much beyond 50, 55%, the, the anterior operation is a little bit better than the posterior operation. By the time you're beyond 60%, the anterior is clearly better than the posterior operation. And when you're at 80 to 90%, the neurologic deficit uh, rate uh, 
uh, goes up. The other thing that you're dealing with is a 26 year old, which means that this OPLL is growing incredibly fast because you assume it started growing when they became an adult. And uh, so if it grew this much over a period of eight years, and you just do a posterior operation, what are the chances that this you're going to stop this and that when they are uh, at 46, this anterior ossified mass won't grow all the way to the front? And uh, so I think if you just do a laminectomy infusion, the patient will be better. But within five years or 10 years, when this mass grows uh, even further, that he'll be back. And so what we did was we did do a... Um, a posterior operation first. And this was my second case of the day, and I didn't get started until about um, two o'clock or one o'clock in the afternoon, which was a mistake, but he came in um, almost emergently. So I had to add him on to a, a, another emergent case that I did. So by the time I finished, uh, it was uh, six hours and 33 minutes. And you can see the intraoperative uh, O-arm uh, image um, of what it looks like. I was able to get in from the back and remove a lot of the tumor from a lateral approach after doing a total facetectomy uh, to get a reasonably good correction. You can see I couldn't um, remove the mass there on the left side, but I did get fixation. I repeated the MRI scan uh, that day and uh, I got a very good decompression of most of it. And had he not been 23, I would have just stopped there. Uh, so I would agree with what people said. Just go in from the back and uh, and and do a lateral uh, decompression, essentially doing a corpectomy, a partial corpectomy from the back to decompress the mass. Um, so then I went in anteriorly. Um, I operate on Mondays and Wednesdays, so I let him rest on Tuesday, and then Wednesday I took him back for the anterior just to remove the rest of the uh, PLL and make sure that he didn't recur. And this is what uh, the MRI looked like. This is pre-op over here, and then this is post-op on the right. Uh, this was sent to me um, by uh, uh, Abdul Razak al um and Abdul Aziz al uh from Kuwait and the follow-up. Uh, and you can see that we got all of the material. We took down the posterior longitudinal ligament, and the pre-op versus post-op, um, the cord has been decompressed. This is what it looked like uh, post-operatively with a corpectomy at one level and a discectomy after having done the, the posterior. And he fully recovered, myelopathy is gone. And uh, the, uh, the take home message here is that if you have an 80 year old with this kind of OPLL, you should just do it from the posterior because it won't, even if it grows, it's gonna grow slowly. But if you have a 20 some odd year old, their occupying ratio is beyond 60% and they have a severe OPLL like this, that a posture alone will not buy you enough time and uh, that you have to do, um, I think, a complete OPLL resection or you will not um, uh, um, uh, do this person any favors and that they'll only last for a few years. Uh, I was fortunate in that uh, we didn't uh, injure the dura and uh, we um, uh, were able to peel the dura off of uh, this because the dura was not ossified. And that's also because he's only 23. Had I waited until he was uh, 43 to do uh, the anterior, I think he would have had an ossified. And then I would use a floating island technique or vertebral sliding technique that's been um, uh, recently um, uh, proposed um, uh, by uh, some of the uh, surgeons in uh, Korea. Um, and uh, so that's the case. Thank you, Dan. Very, 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 really nice case. So haven't, haven't you thought to go from the anterolateral approach with the control of the vertebral artery? Because most of that could be also approached from an anterolateral approach. Uh, and I noticed that 4 5, the, the foramen was even occupied by osteophyte. So I wonder if even if the patient had some symptoms of vertebral artery compression. Um, what's your opinion? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you can definitely approach this from the anterior aspect. The reason I did not do that is that, um, uh, and, and you can do the anterior first uh, and then the posterior, is that I really thought that he would end up having an ossified dura and that um, uh, because that bone was completely fused to the front, uh, I thought, I mean, to the, to the lamina in the back, and because uh, I felt that it was encased in, um, uh, the, the vertebral artery was likely encased in this mass uh, on that left side, 
that it would be safer just to go through, do a complete uh, resection and stop and see what I got uh, before I went in anteriorly. And, uh, but I think that in this case, fortunately it would have been, I think just as easy going in anteriorly first before going in posteriorly, as you say. Okay, no, that's a wonderful case and very nice result. Was there any, any bone metabolic disorder on this patient? No, there wasn't. It's just that I think that uh, uh, in less than 1% of OPLL cases, it grows incredibly fast. It's almost like an osteochondroma kind of a situation, except it's more like a, uh, a malignant kind of OPLL in that ha uh, had we not operated, I think his entire spinal canal would have been filled with bone by the time he hit uh, 30. Um, and uh, so it's, it's almost like a, 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 a benign tumor, uh, a fast growing benign tumor, uh, as opposed to the typical OPLL, which they don't really present typically until their late 30s at the earliest. I've never seen somebody 23 and, and has such severe, or 26 and has such severe OPLL. Andre, you, have a, you, have a, you want to make a, a comment? Yeah. Yes, Betty. Uh, I'd like to ask Dr. You, Nian. You. Uh, hello. Uh, sorry. Ahead, I'd, I'd like to ask. I would like to ask Dr. Dan if uh, he had a, a kyphotic or a straight configuration uh, patient with a cervical spine alignment with OPOL. If it, this is a contraindication for posterior only approach, because sometimes it's very challenging to do an anterior approach in these patients. And uh, there is some case series where they do laminoplasty or laminectomy infusion, even if some kyphotic configuration of the cervical spine. I'd like to know his opinion about that. So what studies have shown is that if you have um, less than 15 degrees of uh, focal kyphosis, and if the K line, uh, you draw a line from the middle of the spinal cord to the middle of the spinal cord, where you're going to be doing the decompression, so if the anterior OPLL extends beyond that line, posterior to that line, then the anterior alone, I mean, the posterior alone is typically not going to work. Um, but even if it doesn't work, you can always start with the posterior. And then if it doesn't work on the anterior, because uh, the posterior avoids the uh, possibility of uh, uh, dural tears, um, so you can always start the posterior, but in general, um, uh, as uh, the studies out of Japan have shown, uh, if you have a focal kyphosis greater than 15 degrees or a K-line that is, uh, uh, the material is uh, posterior to the K-line, then uh, a posterior alone does not work as well to alleviate myelopathy. Thank you, thank you very much. And how do you manage uh, anterior CSF leak when you're doing uh, an OPOL resection? So there are two ways to try to avoid it. Number one is um, that um, the part that is ossified, you just burr around and around and around it and thin it down and then let it just float up. It's called the floating island technique. And that way you don't even go through that ossified uh, dura. The second one is a technique that uh, Tong Ho Lee from um, uh, Korea uh, reported on, and that is that instead of, um, uh, let's say that you have uh, OPLL behind C5, what you do is you go in from the anterior aspect, you cut the lateral aspects of C5, you cut the disc space, and you remove the part of the anterior cortex of C5. Then you put on a plate uh, and uh, you put screws into C4 and C6, and you put screws into C5, and as you turn it, it brings that entire vertebral body anteriorly away from nice. the cord, and that's called a vertebral sliding technique. And that also works very nicely. Um, uh, my only concern is that uh, how, how good of a fusion can you get uh, if you do that? But you could always do that and go in the back and do a fusion also, and he shows very nice techniques of uh, it fusing nicely. Now, once you've got a dural tear, uh, uh, you've got a big hole in the front. You have to patch it, and then you have to put fiber and glue, and then I take the graft and put it snug up against it, and then I put in a lumbar drain, and, uh, uh, and because the choroid plexus makes 10 to 20 cc's, uh, um, uh, you siphon off 10 to 20 cc's per hour. You have to have them in a neuro ICU, 
And it's a real pain because sometimes it takes days. I had one patient, it took weeks to get the, the, the um, uh, CSF leak to finally uh, seal off. And uh, uh, so it's much better to try to avoid the CSF leak than to try to treat it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Good. Dr. Dan. Tony, yes. I would like to have your, your take on this very, very difficult case. Well, we habitually in this uh, OPDLL, uh, we perform uh, first the posterior approach to give the opportunity to, to the, the spinal cord move posteriorly and undergo anteriorly and perform this kind of procedures that they isolate of the bone to, to, to try to avoid the holes in the dura where, well, the dura, don't, there are no dura in these cases. That could be a big problem to resolve the liquid or the cerebral spinal fluid. I think so. It's a very good uh, case to do for, for, for congratulations. Any further comment or question from the panel or the audience? Geronimo, what's your take on this case? Do you see those cases in Brazil? Uh, we don't see a lot of this uh, uh, very difficult cases, but we have uh, um, a large amount of uh, Japanese people here. so. Uh, we see uh, some cases of OPLL, and uh, I totally agree uh, uh, with the opinion that if you have similar doses, try to do everything from posterior. Uh, it's better than to go from anterior and deal with this uh, situation. Um, I have seen some people who prefer to uh, let some of the, the, the bone who is very adherent, uh, adherent to the, the, the dura and make, for example, a, a, a corpectomy and let some bone uh, attach it to the dura and not to remove this bone. Uh, I'd like to, to know the opinion of the, the, the other panelists about this because th this bone frequently are, are not compressing anymore if you remove the vertebral body. Uh, uh, so what, what's your opinion about this? I think if we have a regular uh, uh, Posterior longitudinal ligament that we can need it, but in case like this, that uh, the bone is like a hook, which is inside the, the spinal cord, is so difficult to make it. Uh, and and uh, with the, the with the age, the patients like like uh, Daniel say, uh, there are no dura there, and it's a big problem for these patients. And we, but uh, the, could, the posterior approach uh, sometimes, like in in this amount of uh, hook, is impossible to resolve it uh, only by posterior. We need to to take the risk to, to, to go anteriorly. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm Philippe, uh, Philippe Bancel from Paris, are you there? Yeah. Please, show yourself, Philippe. Yeah, thank you. This is very great. Congratulations. I'm very glad to see you. Yes, Adam. Now, Dan said everything. I mean, uh, this is a major problem uh, of PLL and Japanese people uh, de de demonstrate that as soon as there is a kyphosis or a big anterior compression, posterior uh, decompression is not enough. And as Daniel said, uh, there is a very elegant technique. It's just a floating, floating OPLL. If you're not able just to uh, do the, the, the dissection between the uh, uh, ossification and the dura, uh, dura lesion by anterior approach is very difficult to repair, particularly in this kind of case. So floating, uh, floating dissection is a very elegant technique, even in the thoracic area. And uh, we've done that, and Richard Asaki have done that in the past. And I agree with you, Dan, it's a very, very nice technique in case you are, you are close to the dura and you, you think that you're going to enter into the, into the dura. This is a, I, I would like just to say it was a really huge uh, meeting. Uh, congratulations, mm. guys. Okay, so... Thank you, everybody. I, I, I think I end over to Andre Kamalia to, to wrap up. We are approaching two hours and a half yeah. of a webinar. Uh, you know, uh, Andre, can you, can you please uh, wrap yes. up? Yes, thank you. Thank you for Oscar. I think that I like to congratulate you for the organization because as the previous uh, webinar, it has been excellent. I think all of us, we can return home with a good uh, new <coughs> knowledge about, especially these last cases, and also the, all of the presentation of the panelists. And um, for me, it has been a perfect uh, motivation to be here with you. And thank you all the panelists, nothing more. I think we two hours and a half is enough 
uh, and that in, in a Saturday afternoon for all of us. And my congratulations for the big one assistance. Now we have 111 assistants and people are starting to go out. Okay, congratulations. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. For, for taking your time on a Saturday for, for being with us. We have on, on the peak, we have 170 participants, plus people on, on live on YouTube, on Neurosurgical TV. So we are really grateful to, to, to them, to Antonio, to Milano, to Claudio. And uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Have a nice weekend. Thank you. Have a nice weekend. Yep. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very Have much. Nice thank you very much. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. Bye, Oscar. Bye, bye.